Look, we're well overdue for another global crisis, Jamie Dimon says. They happen every three to five years. It's been more than a decade. Um, a lot of our children and grandchildren probably have never seen a bear market. Uh, and as they get more and more invested in the markets and get jobs and they're robo-investing or doing what they do, um, you know, they have to, we have to worry. We may know that when there's a correction or a sell-off, as Warren Buffett says, uh, and, and Jim Rogers and the others up there, that that's the time to buy. They might, may not. Uh, and they may find their present themselves uh, in, a, in the first uh, le learning lesson of investing. So we're well overdue for another crisis. China growth worries, absolutely possible. Russia threats, anything can happen. Emerging market chaos, we're already seeing that start to build. Any one of them can, start spark, uh, can spark something. I don't think these midterms, as contentious as they may be, and with all the headlines there that will be driving, are gonna be the culprit for a market crisis. If anything, I think the odds favor that there'll be an opportunity for another step higher, maybe a marginal decline, but another step higher, even for another year or two in this bull market. At the street, we pay a lot of attention to the yield curve, which is as narrow right now as it's been since right before the financial crisis a decade ago. The potential that the spread between the two-year and the 10-year Treasury yields could invert in coming weeks could signal a dramatic reset in markets. Now, many market technicians point out that the average time historically between a yield cur curve inversion, which we haven't had yet, and a full-blown recession is about 19 months, which is just about how long Trump has been president, which is some people's definition of forever. Um, so that might be well in the future. But it's important to remember that the last time that we had the financial crisis, that that inversion only happened six months ahead of time. Uh, and previous recessions, uh, I'm thinking 2001 and stuff, uh, were beforehand. So 19 months is the average, but that doesn't mean that's what we're gonna see. Still, I think we can take some, uh, some sense of solace that until we see that inversion, and it could be close, it could happen in weeks or, or not, uh, until we see that, there's really no starting gun to, to, to worrying about the recession if history's any guide. One of the axioms of investing history is that the danger that everybody is looking for, in this case, the midterm elections, is rarely the culprit for sparking a major market sell-off. If everybody expects it or everyone's worried about it, it's not gonna happen. Usually the culprit is some sort of big dramatic surprise that no one's expecting. In this world where after the last two years it seems almost nothing can surprise us anymore, we need to pay close attention to our portfolios over the next three to four months because something always does. Thank you for your time. provocative speech. Thank you, Dave Calloway. Another round of applause for Dave. Now, we do have more seats over here to the left, and there's some great views, a great window. So please, if you'll move yourself over to the left, we are a little congested over here, and we, knew, we know it's tight in the back, but we would be very appreciative. Thank you so much. So how many of you have been curious about our wonderful gold sponsor, Nightscope's robot ro roaming about. How many of you have been curious about that? <laughs> Remember, at Money Show, we like to bring you the newest in technology and the newest things coming, and I think this is only the beginning. But I, it is indeed a pleasure to welcome William Santana Lee. He is a seasoned entrepreneur, an intrapreneur, and a former corporate executive at Ford Motor Company. He is the founder and COO of the second largest automotive, automotive recycler, now part of the NASDAQ LK, LKQ. 
Mr. Lee has a BSEE from Carnegie Mellon University and an MBA from the University of Detroit. He is our gold sponsor, and he's going to share with you about robotics. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Lee. Good afternoon. Oh, come on. That's not going to start the money show that way. I'm going to go three, two, one, and then you guys are going to scream like you sold at the top of the market the money show. You ready? Three, two, one. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bill Lee. I'm the chairman and CEO of Nightscope. We're developing technology to literally be able to predict and prevent crime. About five years ago, half a dozen of us got together and said, all right, um, so I was born in New York City. Someone hit my town on 9-11. I'm still profoundly upset about it and dedicating my life to better securing our country. And then Sandy Hook happened, and it was, okay, uh, every time some tremendous tragedy, tragedy happens, uh, across the country, our political leaders on both sides of the aisle stand up and say, well, we extend our thoughts and prayers. Um, hey, buddy, that's not going to fix the problem, and we have a structural flaw in our country. I love our, I love our country, but there's one major financial flaw in it. Uh, you probably could find a few others, but the Department of Defense has a $700 billion budget and gives the troops every level of capability you might ever imagine, and I'm fine with that. But the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice have no federal jurisdiction over the 19,000 law enforcement agencies and 8,000 private security firms. There is literally no one in charge. And that's why over the last 100 years, you've got a million uh, law enforcement officers and professionals and a million security guards trying to secure you, 320 million people in 50 states with a notepad a, a camera, and maybe a stun gun. And this is only going to get worse. And I don't believe the founders of our country ever expected us to build a society where going to work, going to school, going to a movie theater, going to the mall literally came with the risk of being shot or killed. That is not acceptable. Um, so five years ago, we decided to see if we can do something about it. And I'm going to tell you a story about um, how Nightscope kind of grew up over the last five years. Um, and with a little bit more financial bent, because given the audience, uh, we actually did the largest mini IPO last year, and you're probably wondering what the heck's a mini IPO, and so I'm gonna walk uh, you all the way up to that. But before we do that, uh, by show of hands, three questions. How many in the audience think that self-driving technology, self-driving cars, autonomous technology is gonna turn the world upside down? Okay, not bad. Uh, second question, how many believe that robotics is gonna turn the world upside down? Okay, artificial intelligence. Excellent, you guys are gonna be in for a treat. <laughs> so um, we started five years ago and trying to get this company financed was, uh, I've now done more financial engineering in my life than, than actual engineering, which is not necessarily good. But we started in April of 2013. And we ran around Silicon Valley, up and down Sand Hill Road, saying, hey, we want to build an autonomous machine that can give really smart eyes and ears for the security guards and law enforcement officers to do their jobs more effectively, and we're going to help our country. And what we heard is, um, Bill, you are out of your mind. This will never work. Uh, two, you'll need $15 million to build the first one, and it probably won't work. It's software and hardware. You should pick one because um, this will never work. Oh, and mind you, uh, lastly, physical security is not an investment thesis, go away. And so it took us 364 days to raise, what we were trying to do is raise a million dollar seed round just to build the one prototype and get going, and we couldn't get it done, 364 days. Uh, so finally, like six or nine months in, one investor wrote us a $50,000 check, and we built the most miserable prototype you've ever seen in your life. Uh, we got into an accelerator in Sunnyvale called Plug and Play. Uh, awesome uh, cast of characters there. Uh, we built the prototype. We unveiled it in front of an audience of uh, 100 judges and actually one demo day uh, on December 13 with that most miserable prototype you've ever seen in your life. And then the New York Times wrote an article. And then someone else wrote an article, and then someone else, and all of a sudden the money started flowing in. So we ended up way oversubscribed at a million and a half. And we're like, great, 
so you guys get to spend all this time analyzing all these companies and looking at all the disclosures and all the financial statements and sitting through the earnings calls, but you never get the backstory, like actually like what happened? How did you get here? Um, so that's part of this. And um, then we got clients start calling. Hey, uh, so these go for like six to 12 bucks an hour? Like how do I get one? And then we started realizing that this is like not software. You can't just build a beta prototype and just say, try this. They wanted the real deal. So we realized like, I think we need more money. So we raised um, a series A, uh, I priced it. Uh, so I'm the bad internal banker because I keep pricing things incorrectly because we keep getting oversubscribed. Um, but we priced uh, three, uh, $3.8 million uh, series A, we raised the money, and then we built seven more miserable prototypes. Um, we got our first paying client in May of 15, and we're so excited. We're gonna go put this machine out in the world, and I don't know if society is gonna allow us to do this, but we're gonna go find out what's gonna happen. So we go put this machine at a mall, and chaos ensued. Um, you had kids running around, this is a kid magnet, so kids running around all over the place, girls holding on to it, everyone's doing a robot selfie, there's lipstick all over the machine. Like, okay, I, I guess maybe we're in the right quadrant. Maybe this will work. Um, and then we built the first seven, like physically stopped the entire company, software engineers, uh, electrical people, mechanical people, marketing people, sales people, drop everything that you're doing, go grab that wrench, go grab that screwdriver, we're gonna go build these machines. So for 30 days, the whole company stopped and we built those seven machines, put them out in the field and it was misery. Uh, because basically these are self-driving cars. We're the uh, worldwide leader in commercializing self-driving technology. Um, and getting this to work was really hard. So we put the machine out and I, I think for four months, uh, someone on the team or literally half the company did an all-nighter to just keep the machines running. Because everything would break. Um, I think one month we ate so much cellular data that on the Sprint network we we're the nationwide consumer of data. I mean, it's completely insane. Uh, machines generate about 90 terabytes of data a year, so it, it's kind of a lot. Um, then we uh, raised uh, a Series uh, B financing, which I, again priced, uh, raised another $10 million uh, privately with uh, family offices and some uh, corporates. Uh, no VCs, uh, by the way, and we can, we can get into that. And uh, we started scaling up, and we started getting these to work in California. Um, and then we got to a point where, okay, we, we need to get out of California and see if we can scale this nationwide. Uh, so we got offered a dirty term sheet from an Asian investor that uh, we really didn't want to do this, and the federal government had changed the uh, regulations that allow young private companies to do a public offering. I want to repeat that. Young private company can do a public offering. So all the financings that we had done prior um, basically, you had to go find high net worth individuals, in some cases might have a pre-existing relationship, uh, but the federal government decided, hey, we're going to pass this Jobs Act and guys can go actually go generally solicit. Um, so we decided to go do a regulation A plus tier two, uh, quote unquote mini IPO. And that, uh, some people call it crowdfunding. I think it's kind of silly to do that because if you think about what an initial public offering might be when you file an S-1, that is one massive crowdfunding exercise except Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley are standing behind it, right? Um, in this case, we're able to raise, uh, we're trying to raise $20 million. Uh, we ended up uh, 26 million, way oversubscribed um, and with nearly 6,000 investors. So now we're kind of odd duck, we're a semi-public company. Uh, so every six months we have the uh, luxury and pleasure of reporting to the, to the SEC with uh, audited financials and all the good stuff that you have to do while you're publicly traded, but uh, the stock doesn't actually trade. The reason I bring this up for this audience is diversification, diversification, diversification. There is now a new way for you to invest in much earlier stage companies before they actually get listed on the NYSC or NASDAQ with some level of transparency because the companies need to report. Um, so it's something that you might want to consider and, and, and think about. Um, and it's, it's been uh, awesome for us. Uh, so now we're at the stage where uh, we're raising our pre-IPO financing. We've uh, 
got brave enough to, to reserve our, our ticker symbol. So you're going to want to remember in a couple of years, KSCP. Um, and the uh, opportunity now is you've got a company that's literally scaling autonomous self-driving technology in the real world with real clients running 24-7. We hold clients in 16 states, corporate campuses, malls, LaGuardia Airport, Samsung's corporate campus, Westfield's malls, Sacramento Kings uh, basketball stadium, uh, et cetera, all across the country. And everyone's working on these huge R&D projects to try to figure out how to get a self-driving car to work. And the kicker there is once they get it to work, they legally can't ship it because there is no federal uh, regulatory framework for you actually to put an unmanned 4,000 pound vehicle on a public road and generate revenue. You can test. You cannot generate revenue. And because we operate less than 25 miles an hour on private roads, we don't have any such constraints. And that's why we're the only ones that are actually been able to commercialize this technology. And by the time the big guys figure out how to do this in the real world, we'll have thousands and thousands of machines actually doing good for society. And I'll end on this one point. If you would have asked me five years ago, when would you have your first crime fighting win that you actually helped uh, your client or a community or, or something, I would have said, I don't know, 2022? Because 95% of the time, a security guard's kind of twiddling their thumbs. They're really not doing much, neither is a law enforcement officer. But, um, and then if you've got 50 or 100 of these machines across the country, like the statistical probability of you being at the right place at the right time and you're going to catch somebody, not going to happen. Well, I'm proud to report that we've had over a dozen crime fighting wins. We know the technology works. We've helped the law enforcement agency issue an arrest warrant for a sexual predator. We helped a, a security guard apprehend a thief in a retail establishment. We stopped a fraudulent insurance claim. We caught a corporate vandal. And one of our clients was experiencing one to two criminal incidents a week. Literally, someone got robbed, stolen car, assault, you name it. Machine's been there for more than 12 months, and the criminal incidence has gone down to zero. So we know the technology can work. It's early days, but it's also an opportunity for us to do a good deed and try to help society. So appreciate you guys uh, spending the time, and hopefully you'll come over to uh, booth 407 so you can touch, fill, and see uh, what the future is going to be today. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> oh, I love it. Thank you, Bill. That was a fascinating presentation. Uh, I also enjoyed the story because uh, it's not easy for startups to, to really come out of the, in, in the market. And um, if we remember Steve Jobs, he started in his garage. And we remember Google, and they started in a house. and. So you're on to big things now, but thank you for bringing your robots and thank you for being such a great speaker and for designing that technology to keep us all safe. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, someone that I have had the pleasure of knowing for a very long time. Uh, he's probably one of the most probably one of the smartest, most intellectual people I've ever met in my life. And when I sit next to him, I get scared. Because when we have dinner, you know, we go on to these many, many discussions that are just amazing and stimulating. And he's just, uh, he's just an icon for me. And for many, many people. He's also an icon in the free market space. He's an, an amazing free market capitalist. And someone who has been very near and dear to my son. Uh, you've sent him many books and authored them and signed them, and it's inspired him. So George Gilder is an icon, I will tell you. He is a high-tech venture capitalist, the author of 20 books. He's very prolific. I don't know how he does it. And the co-founder of the Discovery Institute. He has spoken at the Money Show since 1981. Last year, he discussed his book, The Scandal of Money, which I adored, and its theory of Bitcoin and gold. Now, 
He will expound the themes of his new book, Life After Google, The Fall of Big Data and the Rise of Blockchain Economy, which I can't wait to hear, which echoes life after television. Life After Google presents a vision of a new system of a new world and source of wealth he calls the crypto -sism. Wow, I can't wait. Please help me give a warm welcome to an amazing icon in this business forever and with everyone, George Gilder. Welcome to the cryptocosm, <laughs> life after Google. You thought it would never come, didn't you? Um, well, I wrote back in uh, early 1990s, I wrote life after television and said that the computer of the next era will be as portable as your watch, as personal as your wallet, it would recognize speech, it would navigate streets, it would collect your news and your mail. It just might not do windows, <laughs> but it do doors. It opened doors to your future. And uh, Steve Jobs, I've since learned, uh, bought the book in volume and passed it out. So I imagine that I might have had a small influence on uh, the rise of the, of the iPhone. And uh, life after television uh, uh, and telecosm, it's, it's a sort of long version, uh, had quite a career. And now we have a new system of the world, Google's system of, system of the world. And everybody thinks that it's established forever. It's a monopoly that can't be overthrown. It's going to rule all our lives uh, forever unless the government mobilizes a whole bunch of lawyers to bring it down. I think this is a complete misunderstanding of Google. This is Google's uh, system of the world. Now, c most of us are familiar with its search uh, capabilities. It's uh, 42 uh, megahertz find and fetch engine. Uh, but uh, it's changed its goal now from search to satisfy, to answer questions. And, and uh, to uh, accumulate big data in such volumes and with such a linkage to artificial intelligence that it transcends all the usual uh, creative work in laboratories by human scientists and engineers. And cloud computing is joined with the big data and the machine mind. And all of it is given away for free so they get the entire market. That's Google's system of the world. Uh, but now we're moving into the cryptocosm, and these are will be familiar figures of the cryptocosm. Uh, Craig Wright is, is uh, debatably uh, Satoshi, and certainly was affiliated with Satoshi. Uh, uh, Valeric Buterin was a Teal Fellow, lured from college to do the Bitcoin magazine. And, uh, and as a Bitcoin magazine writer, he went to Israel, where he uh, encountered the idea of colored coins and, and master coins and, and, and uh, self uh, or managed organizations. And uh, so he uh, developed a whole new blockchain, a whole new form of the cryptocosm. And that uh, Bitmain uh, is the amazing source of the fastest computers on the face of the earth, summoned for the very specific purpose of uh, Bitcoin mining. And Bitmain was the most profitable 
uh, microchip company in the world last year by some estimates, some four billion dollars of profits. Uh, that's, uh, there have been various estimates, but, but that would uh, eclipse NVIDIA, which also got a lot of its profits from uh, the cryptocosm. If you don't think it can happen fast, remember that in 2008, the world's four top companies in market cap were Exxon, Walmart, uh, China Petroleum, and Industrial and Commercial Bank of China. And those were the world's top companies of in valuation as recently as 2008. In 2018, it, an uh, amazing change, an amazing revolution, Apple, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft became the four top companies in market cap with uh, Facebook lagging behind in seventh. An amazing triumph for the companies of the Google era. How did it happen? Well, my basic principle from scandal of money and knowledge and power and the information, of cap information theory of capitalism that in an information age, economies can change as fast as minds can change. That's a crucial fact to understand. These great giant leviathan companies seem impregnable until they fall. And uh, we remember IBM and digital equipment and HP and all these giants that seemed previously immutable but that are now uh, subsiding into the background of our lives. In 2023, if you project from today, you might suppose that the four leading companies by market cap will be Chinese. Uh, the growth trajectory is larger in these, and uh, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, ByteDance, these could be uh, the companies of the new era, but I believe that instead it's going to be companies like these, uh, the cryptocosm, uh, Bitmain, Ethereum, NEO, which is the Chinese Ethereum, and Hedera, which is uh, based on a different cryptographic formula that uses the same kind of technique that uh, the blockchain does, but purports not to be a blockchain. It does rounds rather than blocks. And uh, that's the cryptocosm. So we're moving from Google life to the afterlife. And we have 10 laws of Google, the 10 things we know to be true. This is Google system of the world and versus the 10 laws of the cryptocosm from life after Google. And Google's law number one is focus on users. Communications first. Give them free stuff, that's what they want. Uh, the law of the cryptocosm is focus on security. Security first, and nothing is free. Google law number two is it's best to do one thing really, really well. Be world champion in AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning based answers. Google's gonna be, uh, give us all our answers from a process of big data and cloud computing that will be as far beyond human comprehension in the age of the singularity as our behavior is to our pets. Cryptocosm law number two, two is to create a secure foundation, a new architecture of the internet that provides a secure foundation for customers to do many things really, really well. And Google's law number three is uh, less controversial, but I think is fundamentally wrong as well. 
fast is better than slow. That's true most of the time, but uh, the cryptocosm law recognizes that just accelerating computation does not create some emergent mind that can transcend human capabilities. Computer technology is utterly meaningless without its human programmers, without what Alan Turing called the oracles that were absolutely necessary to give any machine intelligence its validity and capability. So uh, the cryptocosm slows the existing computer technology down as an overall system by a factor of 10,000. That brings it down into the acoustic range where people can actually hear it and know what it means. Google law number four, democracy on the web works. Keep it on the web though. Uh, Google is a hierarchy, we rule. The cryptocosm law is different. The cryptocosm is not exactly a democracy. It's more, more reflects the genius of the American founding. It's a republic. And uh, in a blockchain, if 51% uh, of the nodes can get together and control the process, they can capture the blockchain and create a 51% attack, which is Bitcoin's biggest threat. You'd, uh, a blockchain is based on distributing power, not on amassing power. Google law number five, you don't need to be at your desk to need an answer, yeah. Gosh, we better buy AdMob for ads on smartphones. The cryptocosm law number five is if your smartphone is smart, the least it can do is suppress ads. <laughs> this, I wrote a book, The Scandal of Money, last year. This is the scandal of advertising, mobile advertising. Ads account for about 30% of customer bandwidth costs. That's what you're paying when you pay for your smartphone bandwidth. You're paying 30% to accommodate a stream of ads. The click-through rate for smartphone ads is 0.06%. The error rate of that click-through rate is 50%. You know, that's, that, I think that underestimates it. Most of the time when you click on an ad, it's a mistake. Uh, that means, in any case, giving them the 50%, you get a net ad click-through rate of 0.03%. That's a fiasco. That's a scam. Uh, that is not a business. And we'll, it, you know, they're, they aren't ads. They are minuses. Value subtracted ads, even mine, you stumble on them. Well, Brendan to the rescue. This is the Brave browser. I love the Brave browser. It's attempting to establish a whole new advertising economy through the issue of, of tokens, which uh, allow, which create a new rational structure for advertising and micropayments. Brendan Ike was the founder of, one of the founders of Netscape. He would, wrote the JavaScript programming language, which is the most widely used programming language in the world. He's one of the great figures of Silicon Valley at Netscape, and he's now uh, and head of the Mozilla Foundation. He left there. Uh, and uh, he's now uh, brave. Google law number six. Oh, this one I like. You can make money without doing evil. So they got data centers with net zero carbon footprint through solar and windmill offsets. 
kind of druidical sun hinges around their uh, data centers that, uh, that reflect uh, a religious cult. But uh, real money is good. And uh, the biggest waste of energy is the $5.1 trillion per day of currency trading that doesn't even establish a monetary standard that any entrepreneur can rely upon. It's, uh, that's the waste. It's true that the cryptocosm, that Bitcoin mining is wasteful of energy, but it, that waste doesn't compare with the $5.1 trillion a day. Money is a measuring stick, not a magic wand for central bankers. Google law number seven, there's always more information out there. And we can get it by giving away our services for free. This is Google Marxism at work. A lot of people don't really understand Marxism, so they think Google Marxism is some tremendous exaggeration. How could they be Marxists? Uh, they're rich. but. But the key Marxian error was to imagine that uh, the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century was the final solution for human productivity, that uh, those steam engines and turbines and looms and railroads were the ultimate human achievement of productivity. In the future, the challenge would be distributing wealth rather than creating wealth. And today, Google repeats this error. They imagine that their machine learning, their AI, their robotics, their free model will, uh, will uh, actually uh, be the final Amer human atta attainment, the eschaton. And, uh, but, uh, Information should be owned by its creators, not by its distributors. And there's Google's law number seven. Oh, I'm going the wrong direction, sorry. <laughs> That's not gonna work. All right, um, the need for information crosses all borders is Google's uh, uh, rule number eight. But the cryptocosm respects the borders of your computer. Security is the property of the user and device, not the network, or necessarily even uh, the nation. You can be serious without a suit. We'll uh, leave that to Google's law number nine and give us your username, password, date of birth, PIN, last four <laughs> digits of your social security number, mother's maiden name, another password, favorite singer, first home address, another password, etc. Cryptocosm number nine, you can conduct transactions without committing personal data to an insecure internet. Google law number 10, great just isn't good enough. We're casually great, cosmically great. Cryptocosm law number 10 is, we provide an architecture of security and timestamp factuality which enables our customers to be great. Security first. So the Google system of the world is broken in 10 different ways. The cryptocosm disperses the clouds and remedies the disorders of the Google world with sky computing, where all your computers uh, are secure and can control their own data and their own access and their own identity and uh, their own content. And uh, we have $20 billion of ICOs uh, on the Ethereum blockchain now, the remedy for the 90 percent drop in the number of IPOs and the 50 percent shrinkage of the public companies. Real money is what remains scarce when all else becomes abundant. It translates the scarcity of irreversible time into the economy. And time remains scarce 
even when my verbiage is incomparably abundant. And we could go on. A remedy for the poorest pyramid of the internet stack, a block stack. That's a crucial cryptocosmic company. And uh, the Chinese version of the block stack is NEO, and that's Da Hong Fei. Life after Google. Half empty, half full. A cryptocopia, folks. Thank you. Thank you, George. That was a brilliant presentation. I told you he is an icon. I've listened to him over the years, and let me tell you, the words of wisdom is, are always spoken by George Gilder, so thank you for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. <laughs> always unique, always unique. With 30 years' experience in the banking industry and a highly sought-after speaker on financial topics and global market developments across the country, Chris Gaffney brings clients an expert and straightforward perspective on investing in today's dynamic global economy. Guided by the philosophy that the individual investor should have access to not just the typical equities and bonds, but to the same precious metals and foreign currencies normally reserved for institutional investors. The world market's products offerings reflect his belief that portfolio diversification is a key component to the individual's financial security. Mr. Gaffney's unique insights have appeared in a number of respected national and international media, including the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Financial Times, Barron's, and CNBC. Please help me give a warm welcome to this global financial expert, Chris Gaffney. Thank you very much. I'm a, I'm a little worried because I didn't bring any robots, and I'm, I'm certainly not George. It's, it's tough to follow a guy like George, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, I always start out my uh, uh, presentations to make the lawyers happy, so while everyone reads through the page of disclosures about what I'm going to say, I'll give you a little background on TIAA. I'm, uh, uh, just, uh, my bank was just purchased by TIAA, and um, we're really happy to be part of this organization. TIAA was founded 100 years ago, so we turn 100 years to uh, this year. It was founded by Andrew Carnegie to take care of teachers' retirements. So um, very noble f cause, and, and we continue um, to really take care of retirement money and, and help um, individuals who serve others to uh, uh, retire with dignity and, and uh, uh, good financial planning. I run the World Markets Desk at TIA Bank, uh, where we uh, help clients diversify into precious metals, foreign currencies, and uh, we have a unique product called the Market Safe that I'll get into a little bit. So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the global economy, uh, giving an idea of our view from the trading desk on what's going on right now in the economy. Um, I'll also share some thoughts on how you can protect your portfolios and the importance of diversification. Uh, and putting alternative assets into an a investment portfolio. And finally, I'll, I'll share some of the different uh, ways that we enable our clients to invest into the uh, foreign currencies and precious metals. I will start out my presentation with a view of the global economy. This is uh, the global GDP, as you can say, see it's about $88 trillion right now, dominated by the U.S. and Europe. Uh, U.S. and Europe make up about 46% of the global economy. China continues to grow at uh, very quick rates. They're, they're no longer growing at double-digit rates, but um, they continue to grow at a quick rate and, in fact, are expected to surpass the U.S. Um, and become the globe's largest single economy within the next few years. Uh, right now, they're about 16% of the global economy. Japan has been stuck in uh, really a, a 
several decades, probably three decades now, of very low growth, in fact, no growth, and uh, uh, no inflation. In fact, that's, uh, uh, there was a lot of worry about deflationary environment in Japan. They were the first economy um, to try to go negative with their interest rates. They, um, their central bank is trying to protect their, uh, their economy by uh, just about buying everything. They're, the central bank now is the largest holder of uh, their own government debt. They're the largest holder, in fact, of the equities in the Japanese economy. So the government has bought up everything in order to try to support prices. Um, India, while, while Japan's been kind of stagnant, we've seen India and, and Brazil, a couple of the BRIC countries, and commodity-based economies start to catch up. And then I've got Canada, uh, which is also growing in, in stature and, and continues to increase. Recently, well, uh, it's been a, a little while ago now, but uh, the people of the UK decided to exit the European Union. Uh, so when you subtract uh, the UK uh, from the EU, you'll see that it drops uh, the EU back down to just above where China is. It's still in second place, but uh, just below, um, just above China, and then the UK slots in at around uh, right about the same size as India. So I'll start anal uh, the analysis with what we think about the U.S. economy. It's the largest uh, economy in the globe and certainly the one that's leading the rest of the globe out of the Great Recession. Uh, the U.S. economy is uh, doing very well. We've got uh, the labor market unemployment at record low levels. Uh, we've got a stock market that this week um, will uh, surpass the longest running bull market in history. Um, we've got interest rates that are heading higher, but even with uh, two or three more increases, they're still very accommodative. They're still below um, what the Fed considers um, neutral interest rates. Uh, equity markets, as I said, are, are soaring, as is the housing market. Now, the housing market's uh, taken a bit of a hit lately with interest rates starting to jump up, but uh, housing is still doing very well. And finally, we've got the, the tax cuts um, that really gave a boost to the U.S. economy. It, it uh, helped companies and uh, will continue to um, give, give a boost to the U.S. economy as those corporations pay less in taxes and are able to uh, pay out higher dividends or reinvest into new capital. The Fed certainly has signaled victory. Uh, this is the old Fed chairman, Janet Yellen, uh, about a year ago now. She came out and uh, pretty much declared victory in saying that, um, you know, that, that we're past the crisis, we, were, we got through the crisis. And what I find interesting on this quote was that, you know, she, she says that there, there will never be, um, uh, I don't believe there will ever be another financial crisis in our lifetimes. Now, if she would have said in her lifetime, I would have been a little more comfortable with that, but um, you know, that worries me a little bit. I'm, I'm not that old, so uh, um, you know, that's a long time. Uh, I think that's a bit over optimistic. Uh, the new Fed chair has, has been very optimistic also. This was just uh, about a month ago. He came out and said uh, uh, what we all kind of already knew, unemployment's uh, doing great. The economy's running up. Um, you know, they, he feels like it's it's strong enough now to withstand some interest rate increases. We can normalize interest rates. <coughs> Excuse me. We can get uh, interest rates off of zero and start bringing them back up. So, good news for savers. Good news for retired folks. Uh, I think good news for the markets. Uh, uh, you know, it's unusual to have uh, zero or no near zero, in some cases, negative interest rates. Uh, again, though, he, he says that, you know, he sees no signs of excessive borrowing or leverage. I'll, uh, I'll show you a, a, a chart here coming up in a little while that I, I think argues that there is uh, some, some excessive borrowing going on right now and, and leverage is creeping back into this market. Uh, this chart is the 210. So, you know, while the Fed is claiming victory and doesn't see any problems on the horizon, um, the, the markets have a different view. Uh, this is uh, the 210 spread. It's, it's a, um, the difference between the ten year, yield on a 10-year versus the yield on a two-year bond. 
And uh, the interesting thing about this uh, chart is that uh, it has been consistently able to predict the last five recessions. As you see, whenever uh, the spread between the 10-year and two-year gets into negative territory, meaning the curve inverts, uh, the 10-year yields are less than two-year yields, uh, within 14 months on average, uh, the economy has slipped into a recession. It doesn't mean that it, it has to immediately occur. As you can see, there's times when it, it stays in the uh, inverted curve for a while. Um, but the logic is that the Fed controls a short end of the curve. So the Fed pushes up interest rates um, as they raise interest rates. The long end of the curve, the 10-year and beyond, is controlled by the market. Um, so that's the market expecting where they think the inflation rates are going to be and, and where they think growth, the global growth, is going to go. And so right now you're seeing that um, the market doesn't believe we're going to get the growth um, that the Fed is, is expecting. And we're very close uh, to inverting the yield curve. This is the chart I mentioned earlier. This is uh, global debt, our, our total debt. Um, and as you can see, it has uh, grown exponentially uh, over the past couple decades. Uh, uh, it took a bit of a pause during the uh, great deleveraging of the, of the recession when during the financial crisis we saw both individuals and uh, corporations delever, uh, get rid of some of that leverage. But uh, they've started to lever back up again and as you can see, uh, debt now in, in the U.S. especially is at the uh, highest levels we've ever had. And, and that's really a concern, especially when you consider that interest rates are going to start heading higher. Um, so all this debt that's sloshing around the market um, is typically inflationary. It also, um, as interest rates increase, obviously servicing that debt gets more expensive. Um, so it's going to put governments, corporations, and even individuals in a position where they have to choose whether or not they can service their debt or um, buy groceries or in the, in the case of government uh, meet obligations uh, other than servicing that debt. So uh, that is certainly a concern. Debt is growing. So, so these are you know, what, what we uh, uh, feel is uh, r the real case of the U.S. economy and something that um, we're still optimistic but uh, there are still some concerns. First of all, you know, debt is growing, as I, as I showed on the last chart. Um, we also have trade tensions ratcheting up, and uh, those trade tensions naturally could lead to a currency war. We've already started seeing um, uh, the, the currencies coming into play and uh, countries trying to lower their currencies or jawbone their currencies down in order to make their exports more competitive. Uh, China certainly has offset uh, basically offset the total cost of the tariffs that we've put on them uh, by depreciating their currency. Uh, that way um, they, they are still paying about the same that they were paying pre-tariffs with the depreciated currency. And a big question globally is, is can uh, the economy continue to grow with higher rates? Uh, the, the central banks have certainly supported the markets with these low rates and, and the question is what happens to the economy as interest rates increase. And finally, the, uh, the tax benefits, uh, it gave the, a boost to, uh, to corporations and individuals, it, it, it encouraged them to go out, um, but some of that's kind of way fading now. We're, we're seeing some of the initial impacts, the initial surge start to fade. And then um, what's left of, of the tax policy um, if we don't get the growth um, to pay for those tax cuts, uh, it just puts us into more deficits. So uh, uh, long run, uh, tax cuts uh, could be harmful to the economy. Certainly uh, at the beginning, it, it's wonderful, but uh, uh, the long run could be negative. So that's what, that's what we fear about the markets. There's, um, again, we're very optimistic, but uh, there are concerns. There's concerns uh, not only in the U.S., but across the globe, all the developed economies. Uh, the fiscal deficits that we continue to see uh, countries running, uh, the monetary policies, uh, you know, uh, putting uh, negative interest rates into the economy. Uh, it's a question of what happens as uh, the central banks reverse those interest rate policies. Um, and, and a point that I made earlier, the U.S., uh, the ECB, the Fed, 
and uh, the Japanese, the Bank of Japan, have been levitating their economies. They've been holding up their asset prices by uh, going in and actually purchasing them, um, keeping interest rates low and, and bringing their equity markets up. The question is, as they pull back on that uh, stimulus, as they pull back that support, will those economies continue to be able to stand on their own? And finally, the trade wars, uh, uh, there are no real winners in, in either trade or currency wars. So what can you do? Um, this chart shows that there's diversification. Um, and, and it really points out, I know it's hard to read from the, from the back, but uh, basically the color codes are, are each different asset class. And what we're trying to, attempting to show here is that there's no one asset class that is consistently on the top, and there's no asset class that's consistently on the bottom, although, as you can see, the blue is the commodity asset class, and it's been hit pretty hard here the past four or five years. And, and real estate investment trusts, the, the REITs, have done well, commercial real estate. But uh, uh, again, the, the key to having a portfolio that survives all the different ups and downs of the, the global economy is diversification. I deal with the uh, currency markets. Obviously, that's my specialty, currencies and precious metals. So um, it, it really, I took note in January when we had the Treasury Secretary come out and actually say um, he, he thinks a weaker dollar is good. Now, um, the administration had him step that back because uh, officially a strong dollar policy is, is the official policy of the administration ever since Rubin. Um, but uh, still, the, the Treasury Secretary obviously is starting to think, and uh, we've certainly seen President Trump talk about, you know, the value of the currency and adjusting the value of the currency in order to be more competitive in the global market. Um, not so sure we have a real commitment to that strong dollar policy. This dollar chart, you can see it's, it, we've been actually in a decline over the past 30 plus years. Um, now there's been several times where the dollar has rallied during that time period, in fact three of them, um, but then it's uh, actually fallen more after that. So we, we continue over the past 30 years to make lower highs and lower lows. So we're in a downward trend on the US dollar. Uh, as you can see, the very end of that chart uh, we made a turn in 2017, the dollar started dropping again. It's rallied so far in 2018, mainly on the back of safe haven buying, uh, but we think we're, we're gonna see it continue to, to slow down, and so we think there's some opportunity in the currency markets. Um, I, I have a workshop tomorrow where I'll, I'll dig deep into exactly how we analyze the different currency markets, but basically, we can look at currencies just like you would look at an equity. And, and you want to see what uh, the under fundamentals of the underlying company is. So we look at uh, global GDP, current account surplus, uh, the budget balance and debt. Both are, are measures of, of if that country can pay back the IOU that is that paper currency. And finally, real interest rates. Uh, those countries with higher real interest rates will typically attract more capital and uh, be able to support a higher value of currency. Um, I've highlighted a couple uh, countries that have, uh, that fit the criteria. Uh, you'll see a, a, a few of the, uh, a few of those are uh, China and India. And, and we're real positive on, on uh, the prospects in both China and India and for a couple, couple major reasons. First of all, uh, growth rates continue to lead the global economy. India is going to actually outgrow China this year. Um, but both are massive economies and, and growing at uh, very good rates. Also, the emerging middle class. Each of these economies has gone through a shift. China especially has gone from an export-driven economy to where now over half of the GDP is made up of, in, uh, of consumption. So uh, they have gone, shifted to a consumption economy. Uh, and that is the importance of that expanding emerging middle class. 40% of global consumption is going to be uh, consumed by India and China by 2020. Demographics favor China and India. Uh, the median age are much younger, uh, much more vibrant economies, and well-educated uh, are getting better educated. So that's an important factor. And finally, uh, this is one of the biggest factors, and, and that's the savings rates. Um, the current account surplus is really a, a result of savings rates that are, that are positive. 
Uh, in the U.S., we've had a very low savings rate. And as you can see, there's a, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, there's actually a decimal point. That's not 24%, that's 2.4%. So uh, savings rate in China is about 44%, India is 30%, U.S. is 2.4%. So um, again, I, I'm running out of, of, of time, so I'm not going to dig too deep into these currencies, but um, certainly, uh, if you stop by the booth, I can get more into uh, what, what I think about the different currency markets. We offer several different products at the bank, pretty unique um, in that we offer FDIC-insured foreign currency deposits. So you can actually buy Australian dollars, Chinese uh, remnant, yuan, um, Russian rubles, and we'll put them into an investment for you, into a CD, FDIC-insured CD. Um, we also have cash accounts and savings plans. Um, we do precious metals. Uh, precious metals is another uh, alternative asset class that we think should be in everyone's portfolio. Uh, the fiat currencies are simply IOUs of countries. Uh, the precious metals are hard assets. They're something that uh, retain value. And finally, we, we offer both an unallocated account coins and bars and also a savings plan also in, in, the, uh, in the precious metals. And finally, the, one of the most unique products that we offer is called our market safe CDs. Uh, these are principal protected CDs whose return is based off of an asset class or an index. Uh, the one we just were issuing this week and so we just closed out uh, subscription to was based on four metals, silver, gold, uh, copper, and aluminum. Um, the next one we're coming out with, I'll give you a quick hint, uh, it won't be out until about three weeks from now, but it's going to be an emerging markets currency, market safe CD. Uh, the key on that one is it's going to have 10 times leverage. So we're going to take the return of the emerging markets of, of uh, emerging market currencies over a four year term and then multiply it by 10 uh, to pay out on the CD. So it's got 10 times leverage. I appreciate the time. Um, again, stop by the booth. I can answer any questions. I have a workshop tomorrow. And most importantly, we are, uh, I'm buying everybody drinks tonight. So uh, we are the sponsor of uh, tonight's reception. So uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you very, very much, Chris. We look forward to having drinks tonight with Chris in the exhibit hall, so thank you. Our final sponsor welcome is near and dear to my heart, and uh, I want to share with you that I am an extremely advocate of foster care, and I do a lot in philanthropy, but more importantly, um, Charitable donations for me make all the difference in the world, and I know a lot of you feel the same way. Well, this particular company and our sponsor actually has a fantastic way of doing that. Not only is it a beautiful, fine art piece in a bronze, and you'll see them on display in the exhibit hall, and I'm, I'm just amazed with the art, but it also then goes and, and it gets shipped to a charity and that charity basically raises money and gives half the charity to this organization, Treasure Investments, and half to the charity. So actually, they are doing tremendous work. They've been doing it for many, many years. Michael Shepard has, which I'm very pleased to say. He's raised millions and millions of dollars for charity, so we're really excited about that, and we thank you for all that good work. Michael Shepard presently serves as chairman and CEO of the Nevada, Nevada Mining Company and senior consultant for Treasure Investment Corporation. As a former president of the American Cancer Society in Wisconsin, he has raised millions of dollars for charity, conducting live auctions using donated Gigliardi fine art for the last 20 years. Please help me give a warm welcome to Michael Shepard. Wow, thank you, Kim. Um, an honor, very generous introduction. Obviously, I'm blessed much, much more than I deserve. Uh, my goal today is to uh, share a story with you about this company, its artist, 
its legacy of significance and how I was blessed to get involved 20 years ago, 1998. I, uh, at that time, was president, CEO of National Community Foundation, and um, we had been blessed with raising over $400 million in 152 countries around the globe. And I was speaking at a, a state planning convention in Lake Oswego, Oregon. And one of the uh, certified financial planners asked me uh, if I would have lunch with uh, a friend of his who had a concept that he wanted to introduce and share and see if what my thoughts would be. Uh, his name is Mark Russo. Mark's in the room today. Uh, he is the founder of Treasure Investments Corporation and, of course, the real sponsor and partner of The Money Show. Mark uh, asked me that day, I guess almost to the day, 20 years ago, if I had heard of Lorenzo Guillieri. Well, I wasn't an art guy, and I, honestly, I hadn't heard. And he said, well, let me tell you about this individual and the art. He said, Lorenzo Guillieri, in 1951, was commissioned by the United States government to create a piece of fine art to be presented to Great Britain to commemorate the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. And to this day, Guillory Art sits in Buckingham Palace, as does, I guess, Queen Elizabeth. And Lorenzo, we're blessed, is still with us as well. You'll have an opportunity to see some of he and his family's masterpieces, and they are. So Mark said, um, let me tell you a story, Michael. He said, uh, a couple of months ago, I had sold a piece of Guillory art to a friend for $5,000. And that friend decided to donate that particular sculpture to a charity who decided to have a live auction to raise money. Now, you know, those of you who have been involved, and I know, Kim, you have personally, raising money is challenging. Fundraising is no fun. But with Guillory artwork and this particular business model, which you'll learn more about in our workshop tomorrow in the green room, I think it's at 335 as well. And if you come to the booth to meet with Mark, you'll learn more as well. But Mark said he sat in this audience and the auctioneer showed this beautiful sculpture and started the bidding off at what Mark had actually sold the piece for, $5,000. And within a relatively short period of time, it went to 10, 15, 20,000. And at 50,000, there were still over 20 bidders. Mark was amazed. And finally, the gavel went down and the bidding closed at $63,000. And Mark was astounded. And he thought, oh my goodness, we could have sold at least 20 pieces for $50,000. That's a million. And the concept for Treasure Investments was born. The concept for sharing with charities was born. Mark and the company won, as Kim described, in sharing 50% of the revenue. The donor, Mark's friend, won because not only did he get the tax deduction, he had the blessing of doing what Kim does raising money to help his favorite charity. And the charity won, the audience won, 
And how many times in our life are we seeking those win, win, win scenarios? And they're relatively rare. You look at and you consider this investment in this company and you'll be part of that win, win, win scenario. As a matter of fact, what Mark called me for in November of last year was, I want to do an initial public offering. And I know you have expertise in that area. Would you help us? Well, I'm running a gold mining company. I said, I'd love to. I certainly will invest. But I don't know how much time I have. But if I have time, it'd be an honor and a privilege for me to help. And that's why I'm really here today. And it really is an honor to have you be able to listen and share in what I consider to be a tremendous vision. Matter of fact, if I have a moment, Kim, I'll, I'll give an anecdote. Many of you in this room, maybe not the younger ones, will remember the name Helen Keller. This amazing woman was born blind, deaf, and mute. She could not speak. Matter of fact, there was an Academy Award winning movie. I think it was called The Miracle Worker, if you've heard of it, right? Thank you. In which I think it was Patty Duke and Anne Bancroft who played. And Helen Keller later on in her life became famous. She learned to speak haltingly. It was very difficult to hear, but she had kind of an interpreter who would help. And she learned by touch and speaking. It was just an amazing story with an amazing woman. She was being interviewed by a relatively brash young reporter who stuck a microphone up to her. Of course, she could not see. And he said, Miss Keller, what could be worse than being blind? And without hesitation, Helen Keller said, having sight with no vision. Please come to booth 207 and come to our workshop, brief workshop tomorrow, and share our vision. Thank you. That was our final sponsor welcome, and I also share with you that if we don't have our sponsors, we can't produce this event. So we thank you very, very much for your kindness, and we are very excited about the charities that that organization is helping. Thank you, Michael Shepard. Beautiful. Our next speaker is probably one of the leading, I would say, leading energy economists out there in the world today. I just had the opportunity of being able to uh, hear her presentation at our WOW event today, uh, where she wasn't going to share any slides, so the women that were in the audience are all here waiting for you, desperately to hear what you have to say. The Honorable Kathleen Harnett White joined the Texas Public Policy Foundation in January of 2008. She is a distinguished senior fellow in residence and the director of Armstrong Center for energy and the environment. Prior to joining the foundation, Ms. White served a six-year term as the chairman and commissioner of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. It is the second largest environmental regula regulatory agency in the world. She is the off author of Flu Fueling Freedom, Exposing the Mad War on Energy and Regne Politics from Regne Publishing in 2016, which she co-authored with a great speaker of ours, Stephen Moore. Please give us a warm welcome for Kathleen Hardnett-White as she discusses energy. Good afternoon. It's kind of that time when the eyelids get heavy, but um, you'll be, I'm, I'm standing and cheering before I conclude. But I better figure out my little gizmo. Is this is it? Green means go, right? Mm, 
Let's see. This is um, the cover on the book that Steve Moore and I um, wrote. And um, um, it's, you can still find it on um, um, Amazon if you appreciate this. This presentation is really about um, what I call the uh, misunderstood and um, uh, underestimated shale revolution. There are different labels for the same um, development, but just, just for curiosity's sake, how many people in this room think they have a pretty good idea of what the shale revolution is? Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm, gla I'm glad that um, I can fill you in a little bit on what I think is, a, uh, a, and many others, a, a world-changing development in, in the world of energy. Um, come on. There we go. Th um, to start with a little bit of humor, this is what, the t in the subtitle of the book, this, the, um, um, the Mad War on Energy, this might be a little bit, this is a, a photograph of, a, I think it's pretty clear, but a frozen uh, blades on a wind turbine uh, that is being thawed with hot water from a helicopter, which um, some engineers did the calculations on the energy consumption involved in here. And of course there was um, uh, uh, far more energy consumed by this, um, this um, uh, helicopter and, and the rest of it. Um, than the, than the turbine would over a long, long period of time. Another way of saying that, of a very important concept for electric engineers and others, the, the energy cost of energy. If, if the cost of generating energy exceeds um, the, <coughs> um, the amount of energy, the, the, the way some put it, if the, if the cheetah expends more calories in the pursuit of its prey, um, then the cheetah will die um, if you consume more um, than you produce. Um, I call this presentation the, the great energy enrichment. And a little bit, and I'm gonna go fast, this is kind of a long power plant, but is um, really about where um, humanity was not much more than about 200 years ago. Uh, the state of human welfare now um, and um, so where we were and where we are and who knows where um, we will be in the future. Um, energy, and I, again, I'm, I'm going to go swiftly, um, is a, a, a concept that still mystifies a lot of physicists, knows what it does and can measure this and that aspect of it, but what really is it? But turning points for mankind, at least on the material side or the physical side, um, would certainly be when um, people domesticated animals and plant, planted crops rather than foraged themselves. And then, of course, the Industrial Revolution, um, the often forgotten great agricultural revolution of the 20th century, which against all odds and most of the smart people's prediction, we did not have massive fam famine predicted then for India and China and others. In fact, India not too, uh, <clears throat> too far into the future um, became a net exporter of, of rice and other crops rather than in, in a tremendous deficit. I also put on there, uh, the, the, uh, that's, that's anthrop the AGW today is anth anthropogenic global warming alarmism. Certainly is a major phenomenon um, at the moment. And then I would lift up the shale gale also, the shale revolution. The shale revolution, let's see if I can put this in a nutshell, is technological achievements that gave access to the oil and natural gas trapped in hard shale. Um, <clears throat> The, and it's not a discovery, like a new oil field discovered, it's um, um, a, a question of ac access. Um, um, geologists long knew that within shale was a, a lot of this hydrocarbon, but uh, having a means to get to it uh, was considered largely impossible uh, for a, a long time. And um, the access, again, is not to just an, a new oil field, it's to the mother load, uh, the oil and natural gas of the entire 
uh, form formation. Geologists refer to the um, source rock fossil fuels, often very vilified, but they are um, nothing more than the, the um, compressed and heated remains of plant and animal life that over hundreds of millions of years finally, in one case, turned to a liquid and another to a gas. Um, and that, that mother load is maybe represents 90 or 95 percent of the um, oil and gas um, tele extracted. Um, oop, I think that's, can I can go backward, I bet. I want to go back one more. Okay. This, in a very short years, I think you can see it's, it's uh, production on, on the basis of the leading producers in the country. Look at the little jump of the United States um, above uh, Saudi Arabia, Russia, and China. And this one is kind of an old slide, but um, we are now under 20% imports to this country, could be off any imports, but that makes economic sense in the market, but we still do a lot of business with Canada and Mexico. Something seven presidents promised to uh, achieve and had no look. This just it records some of the amount of, um, of in increased jobs in the other. This is a key fact, the great fact. And I don't know what I saw, but until I, I came across this uh, graph, um, I, I guess I had thought that the history of you know uh, human society would probably be a gradual uh, ascent and not so dramatic. But this measures this graph measures um, um, hum human population, it um, income per capita, uh, and uh, as a surrogate for um, um, ca um, carbon dioxide as a, sur a surrogate for, for fossil fuel energy use, um, um, carbon dioxide. Uh, Steve Moore's in my book submits that fossil fuels didn't in no way cause the industrial, industrial revolution, but without them, it would have probably been a, a very brief phenomenon. But all those things, not that long ago, um, take an upward advance. Um, and that's just the comment I made earlier that um, we, we don't claim that it that fossil fuels caused the industrial revolution in any way, but that it was necessary. And hydrocarbons um, they mystify economists as well as as even physicists in that they provide a kind of second source of capital, a very dense, concentrated, storable, controllable um, access to energy. And just as an illustration of how much energy we consume, how necessary it is for the current um, extremely affluent quality of life we have now. In 1850, um, the uh, world consumed 80 gigawatts. In 1900, 700 gigawatts, quite a jump. In 2000, 10.4 terawatts. And I just listed the 12 digit, a huge amount. The United States also con consumes twice what Europe does, and Europe considers twice, um, more or less, for the um, the rest of the world. Um, and just a quick one on this, and, and uh, also good tidings: the the industrial revolution, in my opinions, uh, in my opinion, um, and 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 still now, for the first time in history, um, really lifted up the middle and low income. For so long, it's, um, the um, you know, society was structured as the very, very, very rich on top, and everybody else labored to serve the the, the needs of the very tiny uh, one percent, if we that's what we still call it. Um, and this uh, nice catchy title by a economic historian in Prin in Princeton, um, he refers to the industrial revolution as a farewell to alms. An enduring middle class emerged for the same time. Um, that's just more of the same, showing out the, the um, tremendous g gains. This always people always talk about the quality of living in the United States, the standard of living that which so much higher um, than other countries. Well, what does that really mean? And uh, I think a, uh, an example is in 1875, about 74 percent of the income, and this is a, for a U.S. figure, um, uh, 
uses 74% 74, 74 of, of an average income is for basic subsistence needs, food, shelter, whatever. In 1995, look, look at the, the shift. Now it's only 13% of income that um, is necessary for subsistence. Another, I think, important part is that the um, um, uh, at the same time that the Industrial Revolution was occurring, things in, in, in um, um, you know, government policy of the most fundamental kind as far as economic freedom, property rights, um, the United States Constitution went farther than any others in, in, in dedicating itself to the, the unique dignity of each human being. Um, and this one, I think, is, is, I'm, is really worth reading as far as what I'm talking about magnitude. And I hope you all have enjoyed this fascinating book by Matt Ridley. By 1860, the capacity of the country's steam engines alone was equivalent to 6 million horses or 40 million men who would otherwise have eaten three times the entire wheat harvest. That is how much energy, in energy had been harnessed um, to the application of the division of labor. That is how possible the task of Britain's 19th century miracle would have been without fossil fuels. That's a great book, by the way, if anybody uh, likes those topics. One of the worst jobs in the world. That ended, as I said, when politics and law and you know engineering kind of came together no longer were very, very young girls harnessed to coal, a coal bin and dragged up a very narrow mine shaft. What, what do we have now in kind of contrast to that as far as our use of mechanical energy? We, that's, we have an average of um, about 102,000 flights across the world, which fills our grocery stores and everything else with what, what was long the delicacies only monarchs. And that one is kind of dated, as is this one. Just shows this one again how, how deeply dependent on fossil fuels we still are now. Uh, that being the, the all of the three large, and how tiny is the the sliver from renewables at the moment? And I'm not doing advertisements for fossil fuels. Um, who knows what energy source um, and engineering techniques will pr replace them? But I and others, um, like Bill Gates, um, um, conclude that current technology renewables um, cannot. Um, produce the energy supply in reliability, in, in, um, <clears throat> in, in price, and all of those. We're still very, very dependent about what a lot of people think is history. Um, and that's back to the um, 20th century agricultural revolution. Another energy revolution in mine, and that just as a reflection of the this is an interesting one, deserves a lot more time than possible today, but these are um, um, images from um, satellites um, that measure um, the amount of plant productivity. You see all, all the darker areas are increasing, um, increasing plant productivity um, in, on an arid area, um, which um, many agronomists attribute to natural gas-based um, fertilizer as <coughs> And I won't get into the CO2 debates, but the, we'll move right along here. I think probably the mo distinguishing feature of fossil fuels and why we remain so um, dependent on them is, um, is the energy density, the amount, the energy content of the resource, as well as um, um, other, other features. But if you look at the, the difference between um, gaso gasolines at 43.6 to 473 um, compared to wood um, at about 15, you can see how, um, um, how, how dependent we are. I think we need to um, look very, very carefully at what has occurred in particularly in Germany and um, the UK in terms of the very, very aggressive efforts started um, earlier than the United States to, and they used the word uh, um, freely, decarbonizing, which I think is an unlikely bet in um, the next many decades, if not centuries. But these are examples 
um, where they, um, like Der Spiegel, one of the major magazines in Germany, has a long article about how electricity became a luxury good um, in Germany because of the costs of renewables. And those two countries now have retail electric rates um, two to three times that of the United States, which is <coughs> quite a gap. Um, that oh, we go. Now I'm going to keep back. I think it's important to keep in mind um, some sort of basic facts that usually are taught to children in eighth grade about photosynthesis. Um, you know the basis of of, of all plant life in this country, um, in which um, carbon dioxide is essential, and that, you know, after, after nitrogen and oxygen and then 2% two, two of trace gases, there's really a tiny, almost immeasurable addition um, to, and then this long, endless, who knows how it will all turn out, um, debate about whether um, we do have appropriate science about man-made global change or we don't. This graph is, is worth looking at because the dark line that goes up uh, and to fast and vertical um, is the, um, uh, is done by the inter inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the, from the United Nations, its arm on climate issue. That's, that's what its models, that's what current policy in the United States is based on. And those below are not uh, modeled uh, predictions. They are actual measurements with, with uh, remote sensing satellites. <coughs> this is just a, a little taste of um, background for understanding um, the magnitude, really, of the shale revolution. I'll give you two, two, two numbers just to take home. The, env environment, the the environmental, the EIA, the Energy Information Administration of the Department of Energy um, conclu has concluded in the last month or something that uh, for the next five years, all new oil production will come from the Permian Basin of Texas. Um, that's a very, a very, um, it's a, a very dramatic statement coming from the usually conservative um, Energy Information Administration. But keep your eyes out for all that's going on. And the economic growth and jobs already created and already predicted, uh, increased manufacturing in the United States, um, exporting now after less than a year and a half um, of <coughs> um, um, two million barrels of oil a day. So I will close there. The future looks very bright, um, I think, on energy and economics as long as uh, politics and geopolitics don't mess up a great opportunity for the whole planet. Thank you. Red pen for a red blouse. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen. That was a fantastic presentation. Very, very knowledgeable about what's happening around the world in energy, and it's obviously what fuels everything. So thank you very, very much for everything. Nice round of applause for Kathleen. <laughs> so how many of you have heard the term, we're in a rip your face off bull market? Raise your hands. Ooh. Our next speaker, and I quote, said that, in February at our Orlando show. Yes, two years ago too. But I, I you know, I have my memories going, so I can only do, you know, February. <laughs> but two years ago too. He is from uh, the state of Florida as Raymond James's chief investment strategist and a managing director of the firm's equity research department, Jeffrey Salt provides timely, insightful market commentary to Raymond James's financial advisors, their clients and institutional clients through daily strategy calls and writings. His weekly written commentary as well as his local and national media appearances. A disciple of the markets for more than 46 years, he possesses a breadth of experience in the field, Few can ever match. He was a managing director of research at Rooney and Company, and when it became a part of Raymond James in 1999. Prior to that, he was the managing director of 
equity capital markets for Stern, Ake, and Leach. But I want you to give a warm welcome to Jeffrey Salt, and he's going to power up. Get ready. Thanks, thanks, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, I thought I was going to escape the heat of Florida, Kim. I was in Vermont two weeks ago. It was 98 degrees. I was in Boston. It was 97 degrees. Last week, I was in New York seeing portfolio managers. We were out doing gigs uh, this week for our financial advisors uh, and seeing portfolio managers pretty much in the Walnut Creek uh, Lafayette area and came into San Francisco this, this morning. Can you all hear me in the back? Is that okay? It's a better response than I got last night when I asked the same question and a, a woman in back stood up and said, I can't hear him, and the man up front stood up and said, I can hear him. Do you want to switch places? <laughs> Not exactly the best way to begin a presentation. So no matter whether I talk to portfolio managers uh, or individual investors or our financial advisors, they say, can it get any better than this? I mean, the S&P is up 305% from the March 09 lows, and it reminded me of that scene from As Good As It Gets, where Jack walks out of the psychiatrist's office and looks at the other patients waiting to go in, and he said, what if this is as good as it gets? And it's actually a good question after that kind of rally. You've had a super rally here, However, secular bull markets tend to run 14 plus years and they tend to compound money at 15 plus percent per year. Now you heard a lot of things in the media. I don't have a time clock down here. How am I supposed to keep on time? Okay. You'll hear a lot of talk in the media, this is the longest bull market in history. That's balderdash, folks. Just because a market declines 20 plus percent doesn't mean the secular bull market is over. And there's not many of us left that have seen a secular bull market. Ron Barron, my friend at Barron Capital, a $72 billion money management firm, was taking me, we, we spoke to a group called uh, the Tiburon, in fact, they're from San Francisco, Kim, about 300, 350 CEOs and CFOs of financial companies, and Ron to offered to take me back up to the GM building because I had to see Carl Icahn and Steve Perella at Weinberg Perella. And halfway through the trip, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, you know, Jeff, there's not many of us left. And I went, excuse me? He said, there's not many of us left that have seen a secular bull market. He said, I got a bunch of very bright kids in my, in my shop. And to him, anybody under 50 years of age is a kid because he's 76 years old. But he said, their shared experience, because they've come into the business in the mid to late 90s or early 2000s, is you buy a stock, it goes up 50, 60, 70, 100%, and you sell it. And you look to buy another one. They don't have the shared experience of a 1949. 1949 was a great year. Sweden won the Olympics, and I was born. <laughs> 1949 to 1966. Were there pullbacks? Yes. The Jack Kennedy steel crisis of 62, where the steel companies raised prices, and President Kennedy said, no, we've got to put them back down. Markets didn't like that. They lost 30% in a very short period of time. But it didn't stop this secular bull market. And then you peak here in 66, and you go into this trading range. Didn't feel like a trading range. The Nifty 50, which would be the equivalent of the fangs right now, the one decision stocks that you were supposed to buy and never sell, like Polaroid, gone. Eastman Kodak, gone. They peaked right there in January 73, and the market declined into December 74, where I wrote my first strategy report. Market was down 48%. Stocks were trading, some companies were trading below cash per share. I called on Larry Tish. Larry and Preston Tish ran Lowe's companies, not the hardware store, the company that owns CNA Financial, uh, Laurel R. Tobacco, the Lowe's, Lowe's Theaters, Lowe's uh, Hotels. And I asked Mr. Tish, why are you buying overseas ship group? The symbol was OSG. And he looked at me and he said, because I can buy the entire company out at the current market capitalization. I can melt down all the ships and sell the scrap steel for three times what I'm paying for the stock. Markets are not rational at inflection points, both on the downside and on the upside. My dad was a portfolio manager. I stepped off the internet stocks in 1998 because he never taught me how to value companies on eyeball views per minute. 
and I looked like an idiot for two years. But I was up 38.2% in 2000, and there's not many people like, that can say that. So if your definition of a 20% rally or is, is a bull market and a 20% decline or more is a bear market, there were nine bull and bear markets within this 16-year trading range. And then we break out in the summer of 82, and you start this sucker. Was there a decline? Yeah, there's the 87 crash. I actually predicted that. I was in Barron's and the New York Times in September of 87 saying the, the utilities peaked out in the spring, the transports peaked out in the summer, and we're going to get a waterfall decline. I didn't know to call it a crash because I ain't never seen a crash. Read about them, never seen it. But it didn't stop the 82 to 2000. And then we peak here in 2000, we go into another one of these ranges. Of course, between here, October of 07, and here, March of 09, the uh, S&P index lost about 56%. And then we break out here, April of 2013. Now think about this. Nobody measures the 1982 to 2000 secular bull market from the nominal price low in December of 74, the lowest prices would get in terms of actual price. Everybody, they measure it from here. When you broke out above the previous high in August of 82, everybody wants to measure this secular bull market from March of 09, when maybe we ought to be measuring it from when it finally exceeded the pre pre previous high in April of 2013. If that's the case, and secular bull markets last 14 plus years, there's years left in this. Even if you want to count it from March of 09, there's still years left in this and very few people forget it, believe it. So here's your range bound from 2000 to 2013. Here's your breakout in April of 2013. This is what a secular bull market looks like, up 1,200% from 82 to 2000. There were a lot of stocks that did a lot better than that. My dad taught me Dow theory. Not always right, subject to interpretation, but it's right a lot more than it's wrong. The oldest theory out there, proffered by Charles Dow, improved on by um, William Hamilton, Robert Wright, and, and my friend Dick Russell, who passed away a few years ago, and I actually wrote his eulogy. So there was a Dow theory sell signal on September 23rd of 99. Raymond James is the only one that wrote about it and told people it's not Jeff Sott, it's not Raymond James, it's Dow Theory telling you the best has been seen and discounted and you ought not to let anything go more than 15% against you. Dow Theory buy signal, June of 03, here's the killer. Dow Theory sell signal, November 21st, 07. That right there is October 10th of 2008. On October 10th, 92.6% of all the stocks traded on the New York Stock Exchange made new annual lows. That's never happened before. That is a seven or eight standard deviation event. It is not supposed to happen in your lifetime. That is where the majority of stocks bottom. The averages went lower into March of 09 because the financials kept going down. Remember the negative nabob said Wells Fargo's going bankrupt, JP Morgan, Citigroup, None of them went bankrupt, by the way. I'm in print in October of 08 saying the bottoming process has started and you can go get the tapes from Bloomberg and CNBC. On March 2nd, Barton Biggs, my departed friend Barton Biggs, and I are on Bloomberg saying the bottoming process that started in October of 08 is complete this week and we're all in. And we've been running with the bulls ever since. Have we rebalanced portfolios? Have we raised cash from time to time? Yeah. Have we reallocated? Yeah, most recently, our short and intermediate term models uh, told us to raise some cash in January, and they told us to put it back to work at the February 9th undercut low, which we did. The long-term proprietary model flipped positive in October of 08 and has never turned negative since then. So what now? Well, these were the things that put us in the tank. Crude oil is not $155, $50 a barrel. Uh, housing glut, no longer, excessive bank leverage, none of these things that put the markets in the tank in 08 are present right now. The only excess we actually see is in the fixed income market. Here's where the, the negative nabobs, they cut off the 82 to 2000 bull market in 87 because of the crash, but that didn't stop it. They cut off the 1949 to 1966 bull market in 1956 because that's when Egypt tried to take over the Suez Canal and the markets didn't like it. 
and they took a hit, but it didn't stop the upward onslaught. My father said, rather than getting an MBA, you should have gotten a degree in psychology because this is the stock market. This is where most people buy. Excitement, thrill, euphoria, the market rolls over, they don't manage the risk, they keep looking at their counts every month, and, and then they get despondent, and this is where they sell. People were liquidating. On my computer, I can look at the order flow through Raymond James's 5 million accounts. And people were liquidating between October of 08 and March of 09, their entire equity portfolios, where if they'd have managed the risk in late 07 and early 08, they would have had the cash when they should have been buying. Not many people talking about this. The number of publicly traded stocks has been reduced by 40%. <clears throat> in the Wilshire 5000, at its peak, it had 7,200 stocks in it. The Wilshire 5000 right now has 3,600 stocks in it. It ought to be called the Wilshire 3600. So if demand picks up, there's not as many companies or publicly traded stocks to buy, at least in this country. Here's your 35-year bear market and fixed income. The yield on the 10-year guy went from 2% to 15%. Here's your 35-year bull market. We think the bull market was over two years ago in fixed income. Don't think rates are going to go up dramatically, but we think rates are going to go up. So you should be very careful with the fixed income uh, allocation in your portfolios. This is proof positive. Who saw Caddyshack? Judge Smales. What did you shoot today, Ty? Ty Webb. Oh, I don't keep score, Judge. The judge, then how do you measure yourself against other golfers? Ty says, by height. So here's Paul Volcker, tall Paul. Rates peak, rates come down. Here's a shorter Alan Greenspan. Rates come down. Here's Ben Bernanke. Rates come down. And here's the very short Janet Yellen. And now we got Jay Powell. Visual proof positive rates are going up. I said this to three anchors I've known for 25 years on CNN. I started doing a TV with Ted Turner in 1974 in Atlanta on Channel 17. Those of you that remember that, the first 24-7 TV, but you had to have rabbit ears, Kim, to get it. I said, I said to them, the economy is stronger than a garlic milkshake. And they couldn't stop laughing, so they had to segue to a commercial and then come back to us. The economy's strong, no doubt about it. If you look at the GDP report at plus 4.1, but the real figure you want to drill down into is real final sales that were up 5.1%, because that excludes net exports and inventories. If, they, if the inventories would have been right on the GDP report, instead of 4.1%, the GDP would have been 5.1%. It's kind of strong. Business optimism. It's the highest since 1983. I lived in Washington. I ran capital markets at a firm in Washington, D.C. The, the regulations that are being pulled off the books are giving us optimism in the small business sector like I've never seen in 48 years in this business. And the administration, I just spoke to people on the Hill today, by the way, the administration, and I didn't vote for either one of them, so you all can't blame me. <laughs> the administration, if they don't like the regulation, they're not enforcing it. Earnings improvement. Before the corporate tax rate cuts, Standard & Poor's Corporation had an earnings estimate, bottom-up operating earnings for the S&P 500 of $141. It's now over $158. Next year, the estimate is $177 plus. And if you believe ISI and Ed Hyman, in 2020, the earnings are going to be 200. So if he's right on that estimate, the current uh, S&P price earnings multiple on 2020 earnings is 14.6 times earnings. This is the advanced decline line, making new highs just about every week. More stocks advancing than declining. Oh, I love this. I have had, I've heard them play games with averages ever since, ever since I got into this business in 1971. So you can make averages do anything you want. So do you know that the average University of North Carolina Geography graduate earns over $1 million more in lifetime income than any other geography major from any other university in this country. And do you know why? Because of this guy. <laughs> he was a geography major at UNC, and because he made so much money, it skewed the averages. 
true fact. It's a true fact. So when you hear these, these people get up here and say that indexing or passive investing always outperforms active, it is a lie. Because what they do, they compare indexing or passive to the morning star, one star, two star, three star, four star, five star mutual funds. But if you take out the one and two star mutual funds, which you probably shouldn't buy anyway, active outperforms just about every time. And they don't tell you that. There's always room for passive investing in a portfolio, but there are times when you want to, the five minutes, I'm done. <laughs> um, there are times when you want to be moving money out of passive and into indexing, and we think that happened two years ago. This is a ratio chart. When it's up here, active is outperforming passive. When it's down here, it's always been at an inflection point where you should be moving money out of passive and into active, and that's been happening the past two years, and active managers are outperforming, by the way. Speaking of valuations, this was the median valuation in March of 2000, 31 times. Here's the median valuation in March of this year, 17.3 times. There are more high growth, high margin companies in the S&P 500 than in the history of the S&P 500. This nobody talks about. There's a tectronic shift from tangible assets on corporate balance sheets to intangibles which you can't put on the balance sheet. So what's an intangible asset? Well, Facebook has got 2.2 billion embedded users. What's it worth? It's worth a lot. Can't carry it on the balance sheet as an asset. Apple spent a lot of money developing and perfecting iTunes. They can write off the research and development cost. Now they have a billion embedded users. What's it worth? Worth a lot. Can't carry it on the balance sheet. By definition, intangible assets are worth more in valuation metrics than tangible assets. Any scratch strategist you talk to or financial advisor will tell you since 1926, the average PE on the S&P has been 16 times earnings. But if you take out the aberrational low price earnings multiples in the 70s and 80s driven by double digit interest rates and double digit inflation and start on January 2nd of, of 1990, January 2nd, 91, 92 through January 2nd of this year, the average PE is almost 24 times. Now I'm not saying the price earnings multiple is gonna expand but I don't think it's going to contract, and I do think there's room for a PE expansion. PEs have not been a good indicator of direction. This green thing is the S&P 500. Here's high PEs, here's low PEs. Look what the S&P did. Historic valuations may not apply under the new tax code. Companies are going to accelerate depreciation and amateurization. And when they're accelerating non-cash items, it means that price earnings ratios are not as good a measurement of valuations as they have been in the past. We think you transitioned in 2015 from an interest rate driven secular bull market where interest rates come down and stocks go up to a earnings driven secular bull market where earnings go up. The average return in an earnings driven secular bull market since 1938 is about 13.1 percent. This was the first quarter earnings blowout. This is where you flip to an earnings driven secular bull market. This is the nominal S&P 500 that everybody looks at. This is the S&P 500 impacted for inflation. It's not much higher now than it was in 2000. And you ought to think about that because endowment funds, pension funds are thinking about that. Plenty of cash, there's your money supply. A lot of stocks at the February 2016 lows were already down big. February 2016 is when Royal Bank of Scotland told you all to sell everything except high quality bonds. That's where the second leg of the bull market actually started. These are the mindset investors go through. We're, in, we're nowhere near this. Enthusiasm, exuberance, we think you're a guarded optimism. The same forces are driving this thing, and actually, Kim, I'm gonna conclude with this to try and keep, keep you up. Uh, soaring levels of creativity, massive new energy reserves, gigantic amounts of capital, and unrivaled manufacturing depth. So I got into this business in January of 1971 for 100 bucks a week on Wall Street. Markets opened at 10 and closed at 3.30. Every morning at 9.30, the trader sent me out for Danish and coffee for the trade desk. For six months, I walked by my boss's office. He was never in it because he was on the desk, because his capital was at risk. Behind the desk, above the credenza, 
big red numerical four, very artfully painted. And after six months, I got up the courage to ask Lenny Mayer, Mr. Mayer, what's the deal with the big red four? And he pushed himself back from the trading desk, took a great big long drag on an unfiltered uh, lucky strike, <laughs> and he said, kid, that's the number of bear markets you're going to see in your career. Don't ever forget it, and I never forgot it. So let's count, 73, 74, 80 to 82, 2000 to late 2002, early 2003, late 07 to March of 09, so y'all better hope I don't retire anytime soon. <laughs> Jeffrey Salt, ladies and gentlemen, wasn't he amazing? Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you so much. And I know he's, he's always on the run. I mean, it's hard to catch Jeff, so we're very, very blessed to have had him today. And of course, you're in for a real treat with my favorite investor for a very long, long time. I actually, and I have never really shared this with Bruce over the years, I used to fly down to Nassau and interview uh, John Templeton. And he reminds me a lot of John Templeton in his beliefs and his structures and his foundations, how he evaluates the market. And I think you'll be in for a real treat. He has some amazing jokes, so get ready to laugh. But between degrees from Harvard College and Bu Harvard Business School, Bruce Johnstone served two years in the US Navy as an officer on a destroyer. From 1972 to 1990, he managed the Fidelity Equity Income Fund during that period, the fund achieved a return of over 1,100%. That's instinct. Nearly twice that of the S&P 500. This return ranked Mr. Johnstone as the number one equity income fund manager in the nation for the 19-year period. In, in 1987, he was named America's best income investor by Money Magazine. He is a phenomenal investor. Please welcome Bruce Johnstone. Thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The noose is tightening. You know, I don't know how many of you saw the New York Times today. <laughs> there were seven photographs on the front page of the New York Times of all the people that have either pleaded guilty or who have been convicted. So other than that, uh, <laughs> so here's the title of my talk. I know the title in your program is different than this, but I really don't care. Uh, <laughs> this, is the, this is what I want to talk about. Uh, the economy and the markets, rational exuberance or irrational exuberance. And as, as uh, the prior speaker implied, uh, uh, Jeffrey, there may be some irrationality of what's going on, but you don't want to take your eye off of the ball. There are some irrational things going on. I mean, uh, Tesla has a secured funding plan to take itself private. I mean, that's, that's in the news. European junk bond yields, and by the way, a European low-grade company, that's what they call junk, the bonds of those companies yield less than U.S. Treasury bonds. I would call that irrational. Argentina and Austria have been able to issue century bonds. Now, Argentina has gone belly up seven times in the last 200 years, and somebody bought their 100-year bonds, excuse me? <laughs> Cryptocurrency, the U.S. household net worth's gone from 56 trillion to 100 trillion. Illinois, by the way, states can't go bankrupt. That's part of law. <laughs> if there, is there anybody here from Illinois? Ooh. Yeah, it's, yeah, I know, it's hard to admit. Uh, but anyway, for all intents and purposes, Illinois is bankrupt. The way they deal with cash and their bills is they don't pay them. And uh, what is going on is that they have this massive underfunded 
uh, pension uh, liabilities, and they can't make the payments. And so what they want to do is they want to sell $107 billion of Illinois bonds. I don't know who's going to buy them. Uh, they want to sell and put the money in the stock market. <laughs> I would call that slightly irrational. And a third of the companies in the Russell 2000 are losing money. Now, that's not a well-known kind of a deal. So anytime you're comparing investment opportunities around the world, you need a context. This is the context that has worked for me. I say that any decent stock market rests on these three pillars. This is the, the foundation. Rising corporate profits. Obviously, you want rising corporate earnings underneath a decent stock market. You want benign inflation, benign interest rates, and plenty of dough. And you want reasonably priced securities. So I want to take you briefly through the strength of each one of those pillars. But before I do that, I want to show you that each one of the pillars in my depiction has a slight crack in the pillar. So I want to see, let's see how strong these pillars really are. Let's start with the first one, rising corporate earnings. And the tailwinds, as Jeffrey just told you, the corporate profit growth in the United States is absolutely staggering right now because of these tailwinds. Now, in addition, there's a couple of things that I have in these tailwinds that might even make it better. One is that China is in terrible shape right now, and I'll take you through that but they're starting to ease. Maybe they're going to do a little better than everybody is concerned about. What if there's a tariff breakthrough? What if we negotiate, we sit down not only with NAFTA, which we're doing right now, but we're also sitting down with China. What if we have, because of our threats of tariff increases, there's an agreement. Everybody say, you know what, screw the tariffs. We don't need any tariffs. That's a breakthrough. And I'm convinced that that is in the background of the mind of the people that have decided to put tariffs on. Now, the, head, the headwinds are very powerful, unfortunately, which is why I have a crack in this pillar. The stronger dollar makes our products and services uh, more expensive when we try to sell them overseas. Europe is softening. Labor costs are going up. Supply chain uncertainty, that's what happens when you put tariffs on because you don't know if you're going to get your materials. If you're building an automobile or a computer, you don't know. And you also don't know the price you're going to get. And so that is a problem of supply chain uncertainty. We're going to talk a little bit about debt. We know that monetary tightening is on the way. The Federal Reserve came out yesterday and told us that. And the China cycle and the trade war, a very, very big if. Now, demographics, uh, this is, I'm just going to make a brief comment here on that. A lot of people say, gee, you know, if we do tax cuts or we do all these good things, uh, the U.S. Uh, economy is going to be able to grow between 3 and 4 percent. Wait a minute. The economy grew between 3 and 4 percent per year many, many years in the 50s, 60s, and the 70s. But the reason was that after World War II, population growth in the United States was... 2% a year. What is it now? It's 0.5% a year. When you have population growth that much lower, there is no way we're ever going to get back to the 4% economic growth rates of post-World War II. I'm sorry, but it isn't going to happen. And I'll talk about world event risk later. So The Economist comes out with a cover story Trump's America, and as you can see, they have a crack through the American flag. So what we're going to talk about today is there are pros and there are cons within this administration, and we've got to be honest about it. The corporate tax cut that took place in January was absolutely spectacular. And part of the reason is, look at all uh, the U.S. developed, uh, of all the developed countries in the world, developed countries in the world, our tax rate, corporate tax rate, was 39 percent. That was the highest tax rate of any corporate tax rate of all the developed countries on the planet, with the possible exception of Chad. <laughs> I'm 
I'm not sure we can call that a developed country. But look at what's going on in all the other developed countries. A tax rate, a corporate tax rate, down around 25%. So no wonder that corporations were trying to move their headquarters to overseas. No wonder they were trying to invest overseas. The tax rates were making all the difference in the world. Now, as Jeffrey just pointed out, look at this. Since 1986, more than a 30-year period, since this administration has come into power, the Small Business Optimism Index has exploded. This is extraordinary. It's a heck of a background for economic growth. Look at daily consumer confidence. The same thing happened as soon as the election was over. The daily consumer confidence index has taken off like a rocket. The U.S. and consumer is improving. The U.S. consumer is 70% of our economy. Job openings are way up. Layoffs are way down. I mean, they're down to the level, and they were, uh, uh, I guess, I think it was uh, today that the layoffs were announced, and, and they are down in, in areas where we had in the 50s when our population was only a third of what we have today. The layoffs are way down. Wages are better. Wealth reversal because of real estate prices and stock prices. The debt service burden remains low. And so the U.S. consumer is definitely improving. Now, your appointments have been canceled because you took too long filling out those forms. <laughs> Regulation, which was rampant from 08, 09, all the way to 2016, and yes, to a certain extent, the financial crisis said, we gotta have a little more regulation, but it was so extensive that it created a lot of uncertainty in the business sector. And so people who were running a division or running a company with a whole lot of new regulations said, gee, I, you know, I don't know whether I'm gonna uh, uh, go out and hire a whole lot of new people or invest in new plant and equipment. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna wait. So the economy grew so poorly uh, during uh, that, that eight year uh, period. And, and I'll give you one example. The Dodd-Frank law, which came in in 2010 or 2011, uh, instituting a tremendous amount of new regulation on financial services business, we at Fidelity had to hire 475 people in compliance alone. Now that didn't make us grow any faster, but it was certainly very expensive. It actually slowed things down. And this is what has happened in the last two years. They are deregulating. They're taking away excessive regulation. And Jeffrey just talked about that as well. Now some nights you just know there's gonna be trouble. So unfortunately, I got to tell you a, re a few bad things about the economy and why I have a small crack in this pillar. <laughs> Here's one, the strong dollar. And you know, because the US economy is doing better than all the other economies around the world. And part of the, and when that happens, you know, you get a little bit of inflationary kick and the Federal Reserve, our central bank said, gee, maybe we ought to do an uptick on interest rates. Now, what about China? China is now the number two economy in the world. They have been the biggest growth engine of the world for years. So the economist comes out, back out with a cover story saying everything is under control. This is a facetious cover. Everything is not under control in China. This growth rate of Chinese GDP is the slowest it has been since Tiananmen Square. And by the way, the numbers, when, you, when, when the GDP is announced in China, you can't count on them because they, the, 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 the bosses up top say, all right, this year we're gonna report plus 6.5% growth, no matter what the underlying growth rate really is. And so, I hate to say it, 
but kids have imaginary friends. <laughs> now, what they've done is they have overinvested in residential real estate, they've overexpanded in commercial real estate, they've overbuilt their infrastructure, their bridges and their tunnels and their roads and their highways and their airports to keep their people working. And they have created, this is a city that the Chinese leadership has created. Nobody lives there. This is an empty city. This is at rush hour. Here's another unintended consequence. China has gone the way of, unfortunately, a lot of, I don't know how to describe these kinds of countries, but Xi Jinping is now what they call a core leader, an enshrined leader. He no longer has term limits. He is, in effect, the new Mao Zedong. He is the leader for life. And when you have somebody at the top who is basically calling all the shots, the problem is that the free markets are no longer giving you indications that people are going to realize that, gee, you know what? People aren't using the bicycles the way. I told them I want everybody to use a bicycle. So they go out and they buy hundreds of thousands of bicycles. This is the unintended consequence when that kind of thing happened. Does China play fair? I'm sorry, but it doesn't. They joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, and since 2001, they have had a 25% tariff on every automobile that is exported into China. Now, you never hear that. There's no publicity about that. But that is a violation of the WTO, of the World Trade Organization Agreement. And they get away with it because everybody wants to do business with China. If you want to do business with China, you have to, op you have to open your intellectual uh, content, all of your patents, all of your intellectual discovery. They insist before you can begin to do business. And by the way, the if you want to uh, uh, move into China and, and, and do business, you with, they insist that you do it with a Chinese company, and the Chinese company has to own at least 50% of your joint venture. And this is the way business is done in China. So the current administration said, this is totally unfair, what has been going on. You're violating WTO agreements. And so they said, we're going to in, and put down a whole lot of tariffs. And as I said earlier, this guy is now the enshrined leader. He's the core leader. He's calling all the shots. What happens when you have a president or a prime minister, you also have a cabinet, where you have a secretary of state, a secretary of the treasury, a secretary of defense, a secretary of health and human services, et cetera. He's got everything. He runs the whole deal. There are no secretaries under this guy. And it's, it is a frightening situation because the stock market has gone from Shanghai to Shangla. <laughs> Their stock market has been the worst in the world this year. I mean, China is having a very serious problem right now with the property bubble, an infrastructure bubble, excess consumer stuff. By the way, they have over 400 electric vehicle manufacturers. They have over a thousand drone manufacturers. They have over 300 smartphone companies. So there are some very serious problems. Heavy debt, they do everything with borrowed money, loan losses are skyrocketing, and they now have a social credit scorecard where every time you make a phone call, every time you make a purchase, Every time you apply for a passport or you want to travel somewhere, they mark it down and they put it in the cloud. And you have a social credit scorecard through internet censorship and internet monitoring. And by the way, they haven't gotten away from uh, pollution. They also have a, a, dem a demographic dilemma. 
Because you know, for 35 years, they had a one-child policy in China, and now they are running out of workers. They are literally, if you ever want to have a social security system in your country, you got to have a workforce which supports everybody who's employed. And China is running out of that situation. Now, I will say this. I'm a contrarian. I believe in value, and I am a, a, a value investor. And so I think you've got to be very, very careful because the news about China is so negative that maybe this just might be a buying opportunity. <laughs> now, I, I'm, I'm serious. I really am. And that's almost heresy to say that. But look what they're doing. They cut interest rates 200 basis points. They've allowed the yuan to wait weaken 9%. They're boosting government spending 10% year over year. They're easing bank credit. The next thing they're going to do is support the stock market. So I'd be very, very careful, as Jeffrey said, be very, very careful about getting really negative right on the bottom. So that's what I'm suggesting about China. All right, I got to make a few comments on debt because when you're up to your eyeballs in debt, you can't exactly go out and pile on a whole lot of new debt to make your country or company grow faster. And so we have a debt up to our, uh, uh, up, up to our eyeballs. But it isn't just the United States. It's just about every country in the world is loaded with debt. In the United States, you can see right there from the vast, uh, almost the... Uh, the whole uh, 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 of the 20th century, debt as a percentage of GDP was below 170%. And in the last 35 years, we're up at 370%. So that is a very serious situation. If you look at federal debt, gross federal debt, which is the way I measure it, because that way you can compare apples to apples all the way back to the beginning of our country, our federal debt has never gotten higher than it is today. So the question is, can we keep piling on more debt? The largest jackpot ever, mega millions, 640 million, our federal government goes through that in 95 minutes. <laughs> We're kicking the can down the road. We're not doing anything about really getting at the root of the problems. So right now, as Jeffrey said, earnings growth is absolutely spectacular. But I am concerned about some of those elements, which is why I have a small crack in this first pillar. What about the second pillar? The second pillar underneath a dis decent stock market is inflation benign inflation, benign interest rates, and ample liquidity. So I've called the family together to announce that because of inflation, I'm going to have to let two of you go. <laughs> now, a lot of people say, wait a minute, we're in a deflation environment, and we don't have any risk of inflation. I'm not so sure. In the long run, I'm a little bit concerned there are a lot of positives why we do not have to be concerned about this pillar, as you can see from the left-hand side. But the risks are that the currency crises get contagious, the huge underfunded liabilities, which I talked about with the state of Illinois, the US budget deficit continues to grow, meaning that our federal government has to sell bonds. What if the Fed over tightens? Yesterday, they talked about another couple of interest rate increases. There is, unfortunately, a risk that they will over-tighten. But my concern in the long run is that central bankers may have overprinted. They may have created too much liquidity, too much what they call quantitative easing over the last several years. And this is where they get the money. I'm not exaggerating. They make it up. They just turn the crank and they make it up. When any central bank wants to go out and buy bonds, they just 
turn on the printing press or open the crank and call up a bank and say, we just deposited $100, uh, $100 billion in your bank and we want you to go out and buy treasury bonds, treasury bills on the open market. And this is how monetary easing takes place. And in the long run, it is ultimately inflationary. These guys have really stacked the asset side of their balance sheets. And in the long run, this is what it does to the value of your currency. The dollar has gone down 97% in the last 84 years. The extreme is when you have a socialistic economy and you print and you print and you print, the bolivar has gone to zero. It is totally worthless. And the manifestation is in inflation. Can you imagine 49 cents to mail a first class letter? What's a first class letter? <laughs> when I was growing up, a first class letter cost three cents. Now it's 49 cents. All right, get on to the valuations pillar. The bear has been behind the curtain for 10 years and he's getting very upset. The bull has been on the stage. The bear keeps asking the director, now, now, and the director keeps saying, not yet. <laughs> so if you look at valuations, there are a lot of positives as Jeffrey went through why the market has been as strong as it has, but the risks are why I have a little bit of a crack in this pillar as well. Protectionism, high PEs, what if the Fed over tightens? Strong dollar, world event risk, which we'll talk about, and Trump's narratives, I'm gonna get into that. Now in the short run, every now and then, we do have a hiccup. Valuations have rarely been higher than this if you measure them with stock market cap as a percentage of GDP. Oh, by the way, Sarah, Where's Sarah? You came, she came down and gave me five minute sign. I think she thought that, yeah, Sarah, I, I have 35 minutes, not 25 minutes. So I don't wanna see you again. <laughs> now, a lot of people say to me, Bruce, the market is, uh, is, is not cheap and I'm saying, uh, is cheap, and I'm saying, no, oh, this is not a cheap market. The cheap market was back in August of 82. We had very high interest rates that were about to come down. We had very low valuation measures, and we had tax rates that were about to come down. So here's another reason why I'm a little bit concerned This guy can't wait. <laughs> he is, you know, maybe it's just gonna be a downturn. Maybe it's just gonna be a correction. But I'm telling you, this guy wants to have his day in the sun. Now this one is one we gotta talk a little bit about. Do Trump's narratives have long-term effects on individuals, on organizations, and countries? Let's, not, let's be honest with ourselves. He belittles and then he praises. He threatens and then he welcomes. He doesn't want to do multi-country multi, multi -country deals, but he will do bilateral deals. He comes up with summit proposals and then, and, then he, and then he sanctions the very same country. He has bold suggestions and then he walks them back. He imposes tariffs and then Maybe he wants to eliminate them all. So the volatility and the decision-making processes that are going on within this administration are causing some uncertainty. And, and all I'm saying is you gotta take it into account, just a little bit, that's all. We have enormous breadth of resources in this country. And I want you to take a look at this. Now look at this fifth bullet point. We have 200,000 strong in our intelligence community. We have an extraordinary amount of resources 
to take into account the volatility at the top of the administration. Now, this one is a little tougher to deal with. The elephant, as you know, is the GOP, the Republicans, the Democrats, are the donkeys. And as you can see, these guys don't get too long. To, they don't, they, I don't know if they don't like each other, but they definitely don't get, get along and they don't compromise. All right, I got one more risk for you, and I call it world event risk. And it's all that geopolitical stuff and political and war and terrorism, and it's not the scream. It's you drive, I'll criticize. <laughs> this one is very sad. The, the tragedy of this is we're talking about a history of thousands of years of, 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 of animosity, and it's very, very hard to deal with that. Now, here's a situation where Michelangelo sculpted this magnificent sculpture of, of the Statue of David, and this is 17 feet high. And this was sculpted, it's now in Florence, Italy, and if this had been sculpted in New York City, it would have looked like this. <laughs> This is, why Mike this is why Mike Bloomberg banned these 32-ounce bottles of, of soda. Now, we thought we were out of it. We, we can't get out of this maze. It is a very frightening kind of a thing. Don't worry, it's just to generate electricity. Now, this one is very, very serious. The Chinese have taken over reefs, literally reefs, in the South China Sea, and they are turning them into islands. And they are building military runways on these islands, and they're installing anti-ship missiles and anti-aircraft missiles. And they are basically saying, the whole South China Sea is ours. Now there's, what, about 10 countries that surround the South China? Why does China own the entire South China Sea? This is a very frightening kind of a situation. And this is supposedly in a democracy. The president of Turkey, he used to be the prime minister, now he's taken, he's done a, a Xi Jinping, he's taken all the power, and he has absconded with, he has confiscated half of Ataturk Park in downtown Ankara, Turkey, and he has built himself an 1,100-room palace. Now, Turkey is supposed to be a democracy. This is unbelievable. So it is just one more example. Now, how about this one? Would you feel comfortable and confident running a country at age 70? I can assure you I wouldn't want to run a country at age 70. A lot of people are unaware that we have so many of our major countries around the world being managed by, being run by, people well into their 60s. Is it drugs? No, it's plastic straws. <laughs> Here's another one. Thousands of years, so much animosity inside Syria. Here's another one. Mohammed bin Salman, MBS. He is the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, and he just came out yesterday and said, guess what? We're not gonna have an IPO. We're not gonna have an initial public offering of Aramco. That's where they were gonna get their dough. And so this is a very serious problem within Saudi Arabia. We already talked about this guy, who is now the core leader of China. And this guy also no, no longer has term limits. Now, I want to make one comment about Ukraine, because this is sort of, everybody says, oh, that's yesterday's story. Because they came over and they took over Crimea, what, you know, four years ago, 
or five years ago, they've taken over the eastern end of the country. What they do is about every three months, they turn off the electricity in Ukraine. The whole country, they black it out. And then everybody panics within Ukraine, and then they say, gee, uh, uh, then, then what Russia starts to do is they turn the power back on. And the whole point of this is that Putin is sending us a message. Look what I can do to Ukraine with cyber offense. I can turn off the power of an entire country. So don't screw with us. And so this is, this is a very serious kind of a situation. All right, this is a list of all of the potential disasters of world event risk. And the scary thing about this is that there are so many of them, and unfortunately, so many that are possible. There are some possible successes with India, with rising markets. You go down the list and you see Charles and Camilla have made it through uh, uh, 13 years. <laughs> William and Kate have three babies, and Harry is married. So what are we going to do about all of this? We can go for the meaning of life, or we can go for cheese and crackers. <laughs> I would suggest that we make the private sector soil fertile. You want me out of here, don't you? <laughs> the, um, I'm on the last few slides, yeah. Oh, Sarah, I told you I don't want to see you. We got to make the private sector soil fertile. So I've done a lot of brainstorming. We have incentives for growth. All we got to do is start to implement them. And here they are. Never, ever think outside the box. <laughs> Actually, I do want you to think outside the box because we got to give instructions to Washington to get the country moving again. And again, I can't go over all of these. I don't have time to do so. But there's a whole lot of good stuff that we can do if we just get the people in Washington to open their eyes and wake up. Give me the menus. You've kept the chef in suspense long enough. These, you, we got to make up our minds. We got to get the people in Washington to make up their minds. They need more incentives to grow the country. And these are such, so, so many of these are just obvious. How about this one? George, George, drop the keys. <laughs> all right, how do we cope with all of this? And I'm on my last four slides. Don't worry, Kim. I'm out of here. <laughs> how do we cope with all of this? And I'm not saying this is the Johnstone retirement portfolio. But these are areas that you definitely want to consider. And, and, and again, like Jeffrey, I'm a basically a very long-term bull as long as you are in a diversified portfolio and you protect yourself against the uncertainties that I spoke about. And I want to emphasize a point that he made, active versus passive, because all you hear these days is passive always wins. Index funds always win. ETFs always win. They don't always win. The vast majority of the actively managed assets at Fidelity outperform, after all expenses, outperform the indexes, the competition, and the S&P 500. And this is, this is not phony numbers. There's no fake news in here. So I'm going to finish with this. We got a phenomenal country. Let's not forget all of these incredible, beautiful characteristics of the United States of America. And I always end on freedoms, freedom of ideas, freedom of suffrage, freedom of religion. Wouldn't it be great if every country had freedom of religion? And how about immigrants? 98% of the forefathers, the ancestors of everybody in this room came from somewhere else. We're a nation of immigrants. And let's be proud. And that's where we get our creativity and our energy and our passion. Thank you all very much.
I told you, he's an amazing steward of investing. And it's the only time he's speaking, so I want you to buttonhole him in the back of the room because he's on his way out, he's got a busy schedule. Bruce Johnstone, you're a titan in investments. God bless you. So, we are excited about our next event. I'd like to call up our panelists, please. The Future of Cryptocurrency with Charlie Shrem and your host, J.P. Mangalinden. Please give a warm welcome to both of them as they approach the podium. Charlie is the Chief Visionary Officer for Crypto IQ. So, Charlie, uh, I don't want to dwell on this, but I do want to take a brief walk down memory lane for those people in the audience and those people watching who, who may not be as familiar with um, your great uh, trajectory, um, as nicely told also in a Netflix documentary. Um, so in 2011, you co-founded BitInstant, is that right? And at one point, BitInstant was processing 30% of all Bitcoins. How was BitInstant Bit different from current crypto exchanges around today like Coinbase, and what happened? Uh, BitInstant was like the precursor to Coinbase. I remember actually sitting in a, in a room with Brian Armstrong when he was still working at Airbnb and somewhere near San Mateo. And he messaged me, he's like, hey, my name is Brian. Um, I'm interested in you know, getting into this crypto space and I'll invite you over for a cheeseburger and we'll talk about crypto. And he invited me, Tony Gallippi, who ran BitPay, and Roger Veer, and kind of like the three of us were ran the three of us were in the largest companies at the time in crypto, and and Brian said, you know, I want to start a competitor to you, Charlie. He told me outright, and I said, you know, I'm really happy to hear you say that. And he says, really? I was expecting you to kind of um, give me pushback. And I said, no. Listen, this it's 2011. This this slice is so small of this pie. Let's grow this pie together, and then we'll compete later on. And so the the bit instant was. When we launched it, there was no way to buy Bitcoin. Right. There was no, there was nothing else to buy. It was just Bitcoin, and we started it because we were evangelists at heart. Bitcoin was like a science experiment. It was for fun. It was an, ex it was a, a social uh, uh, experiment, a socioeconomic experiment. Mm -hmm. And we said, well, we're talking about this thing, and we're getting people excited about about Bitcoin and about cryptocurrency. Even the term cryptocurrency wasn't used. It was just Bitcoin. But there's no way to buy it. There was no way for anyone to buy it, or you know, so we set a thing for twenty dollars. You can buy five thousand Bitcoin, whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, and so now, and I know you've been open about this, and it's it's been an uh, it's been a great ride for you. It's been a cool ride yeah. for you. Um, you went from being a Bitcoin millionaire to at least at one point uh, washing dishes. Yeah. What happened, and what did you learn from that experience? It's a it's a very um, it's an experience that that brought me. Uh, I hope a lot of humility. Um, I'm not perfect, but I try to, to be a better person through it. But essentially, like you said, I, you know, um, crypto was doing really well in 2012, 2013. The price, you know, jumped all the way to thousand dollars, starting around like a dollar or two. And um, I acted like my crafted instinct, like that I was king of the world, and I was young. I was 21, 22 years old. And but instant, um, you know, we we were a very big company for for crypto, especially before any startup. We had 30 employees. And what had happened was I, um, through the course of running this company, I started in my parents' basement. I um, allowed a, a customer of ours to purchase Bitcoin, and I knew he was buying that Bitcoin to then resell it on the Silk Road. And because of that, I was arrested at JFK Airport in 2014, and um, I was guilty of uh, aiding and abetting the operation of an unlicensed money transmitting business and served two years in federal prison. Got it. What was the, what was the prison time like? What, what did you learn from that? Prison was an interesting exper uh, experience. If if anyone follows my, uh, <laughs> yeah, <it was. laughs> to say the least. <laughs> um, if anyone follows my Twitter, I yeah. I'm posting this series that I actually wrote as a therapeutic thing for me when I got out. I wrote this kind of got all on paper and I'm releasing it chapter by chapter called the Geek in Prison, mm -hmm. um, and it just talks about the inside of like what visitation is like, mm -hmm. what. Uh, the prison food was like, you know, how I had someone train me as a, you know, to, to, to lose some weight in personal training. Um, but it's an experience where in, out in the real world when you're on the top, because you have an ego, because you're like a person who talks like they're uh, an amazing person, 
those are the people in prison that are at the bottom. And it's the and, and it's it's in prison it's the people that are that are don't have egos and are not like um, bad people that are ones that are kind of at the top. So I had that like uh, when I walked in, I didn't really know what to expect uh, apart from what people told me. Um, but it was a huge humiliating experience for me. Um, and at the same time, like it, w it was scary. Like there was one thing I I didn't take into consideration other people's feelings. I'll give you an example. Yeah. You know, at 10 o'clock, lights off, lights were out, and I had a little light by my bed, like a, a, a halogen whatever light. And I like to read, so I would keep my light open and read. Um, I think like at 10:30, this big guy walked up to me, and I was on the top bunk, and he was six feet tall. So he comes right up to my face, and he goes, he "Goes, you like reading?" I said, "Yeah." He goes, "You know, we're all trying to sleep here, right?" And I was like, "Oh shoot, I'm sorry." And he goes, "Here, borrow my book light. Just give it back to me when you buy your own." And I was like, "Oh, thank you. That's so nice of you." <laughs> Best case scenario. He was, yeah, he was really nice. About we ended up becoming really good friends, and he would make me gyros once a week. He made these gyros, and. Finally, the, the prison administration thought it would be a joke to put, I grew up in a very religious Jewish community, mm -hmm. to put me in my first bunk with the, the imam of the prison Muslim community. They thought they would be funny about that. Ended up being, we became really good friends because we had a very good uh, conversations about our different religions mm -hmm. and it were very respectful conversations. And he kind of had me under his wing and he, he told people to like, you know, leave me alone and stuff. And he made some good gyros too. <laughs> okay, so it's a win-win. Yeah. That's awesome. So you, so you get out and um, talk about Crypto IQ and, and how, how that came about. Sure. So, so when I got out, uh, I was trying to wait and figure out what my next thing was. Uh, I got out. I didn't tell anyone. I waited a few months. My wife and I, who my fiance at the time, we, we lived in Pennsylvania and mm -hmm. we just kind of lived off the radar. I, I, it's funny. It's weird to say it. So it's hard for people to understand, but I actually didn't even turn my uh, a phone or a computer on for like three to four months after I got out. I said, I don't want anything to do with it. No internet, totally just punched completely out. punched out. I wanted to get back into the world because, you know, frankly, a little weird. You come out and you have to acclimate yourself. I was only in there two years, but it's, it's still a long time and, and understand that you, you get used to that, to that mentality in there. So I got out and I had to maintain a, a real job. So um, you get, as soon as you get out, you can't have any access to the internet. You live in a halfway house. And you have to rely on the, your, your, your people, that, that your people basically, your family mm -hmm. and friends, to find you work. And if you can't find work, within 21 days you go back to prison. So my wife found me a job as a dishwasher, because mm -hmm. it was the only job that we, I can get sight unseen. No one knew anything about me in Pennsylvania. I walked in there, I was paid $8 an hour, and I killed that job. Yeah. They promoted me to food runner in six weeks. Nice. And I was the order expediter for like a 200 table restaurant. I was proud of that, I was. I mean, I, it's hard work. It's, very hard work. Anyways, after that, um, I was fully released, and um, my wife and I and my mother-in-law, we moved to Florida, had a fresh start, and I met some, uh, some really good business partners, and I said, I really want to get back into the education. So we started Crypto.IQ, and um, because I was seeing what was happening was a lot of these companies were charging three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 to have a basic crypto education, and there was no way for people to understand how do I get out of the scams you know, a high quality newsletter that you can print out once a month. Um, there's, there was none of that. So we started this thing to keep the price low and we charge 60 bucks a month and you have access to our training room and, mm -hmm. and you have access to our newsletters and our research reports and everything. And that, I want to get back into education. Uh, I think a lot of people in the audience, in the audience and watching and Yahoo Finance will also appreciate that. Um, it is, cryptocurrency remains, I think, for a lot of people, a very dense area. Yep. Um, it's a very steep way to ramp up. Uh, what is your take on Bitcoin today, and how has that potentially evolved since, you know, BitInstant? It's, it's an interesting point. It's an interesting question. In the early days, it was just Bitcoin. And you kind of see these things play out through these bull and bear markets. A lot of crypto people aren't traders. Traders know there are bull and bear markets. A lot of crypto people think that it's always bull. It's during these bear markets, 2014, 2015, is where things die, things are born, and we build. So now you have things like Ripple, and you had things like Ethereum. People are realizing these are still experiments. You know, you're putting your, your wealth in these things, and they break, things happen. Mm. The values go down 90%, the values go up 100%. I always tell people they, they wanna get into crypto, I always say, please don't, like, how much money, if you lost it right now, would you be okay with? $500, they tell me. Okay, 
Invest $500 in a basket of crypto and then just have fun with it. Just enjoy it, learn. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good ones, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dash, Litecoin, there's so many good ones. Yeah. Just learn what, what makes them different, what's the communities. Um, Bitcoin will always be that, that daddy, that, that long-term gold, um, one that everyone has a huge amount in, and you'll see over time the actual transaction volume of Bitcoin go down because people are going to use it more of like a store of value, knowing that it's, if that one fails, they all fail. And so everything relies on that foundation of Bitcoin, but it's definitely awesome to have other projects like Steam and everything to, to, to um, experiment with and see what they're, what they're all about. Yeah, and Charlie, you alluded to this earlier, you know, when earlier on there was just Bitcoin. Now there are, at least according to investing.com, well over 1,600 That's crazy. digital currencies from obviously Bitcoin yeah. um, all the way to Potcoin and yeah. uh, some other niche uh, kinds of digital currencies. What do you make of this proliferation and, and which ones, besides Bitcoin obviously, sure. um, are the ones you think are the most promising and why? So these, um, a lot of people complain about how a lot of these different coins are like getting people into crypto for the wrong reason. But I always try to remind them, if this pot coin or whatever coin gets 10 people into cryptocurrency who weren't in crypto before, eight of them leave because they got screwed or they, they thought it was stupid, there's two more people that we have now in the crypto space. So these projects, these 1600 coins are doing that guerrilla marketing. Uh, they're doing that like on the pavement work that crypto used to do in the early days. It's getting people in, it's getting people intrigued. Everyone is intrigued by something different. Some people are not interested in, um, some people are not interested in, in Bitcoin, the financial system. Some people are interested in, in music and, and music videos and they look at Loop. Some people look at um, all these different projects, like they look at the blogging space, or they look at Steam. You know, everyone has different interests and they come in because that's what they're interested in. And then they stay and they buy Bitcoin. <laughs> what do you make of, um, this is their words, not mine. Um, there's been a lot of criticism also about the cryptocurrency, sure. right? From people like Jamie Dimon, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. I think it was Buffett who called cryptocurrencies, quote unquote, rat poison squared, and warned that crypto, cryptocurrencies will come to bad endings. It sounds very apocalyptic. What do you say to those critics and, and those harsh words? Only time will tell what will happen. Um, usually it's the lack of education that I see people are the most hostile to. When they start to learn and they have an open mind, they realize that this is not all a negative thing and it's not rat poison squared. So Jamie, Jamie Dimon, I know specifically, has a whole blockchain working group at his, at his company. Um, the, I know the person who's the vice president of that. And so he may be saying things in public to appease his shareholders or whatever, the old school guys who, who see crypto as a threat, but internally he's investigating on how to make the most money out of it. And I would assume that Warren Buffett definitely has a secret working group on cryptocurrencies at least to stay apprised of what's been going on. Uh, we talked, you mentioned volatility a little bit earlier. You know, if we just take Bitcoin, for example, it certainly plunged quite a bit and yeah. it, it is resurging. Um, what do you, for people who are, who are concerned about the volatility and the sure. media makes a big deal out of it too, what, do you, what would you tell them? So like Warren Buffett actually says, buy when there's blood on the streets or buy when uh, everyone else is selling and sell when everyone else is buying. Um, I was selling around $20,000 because it was a crazy move. I mean, mm -hmm. we went from 1,000 to 20,000. Um, the market has to digest that. I have certain points that I'm looking for to buy back in. I'm, honestly, I'm, I'm a buyer between five and 6,000. So right now we're at 6,400, mm -hmm. 65. That 6,000 really has to hold itself for a few months. The last bear market was two years almost. So we really have to see that happen. But it's, it's I mean, think about what's gonna happen the next time that we're in a bull market. Um, the volatility of Bitcoin, someone superimposed a volatility chart of Bitcoin over the past five years over silver, oil, the S&P 500, and a bunch of other um, highest traded um, assets. And Bitcoin wasn't even in the top five. Mm. Um, silver is definitely more volatile than Bitcoin, and people are looking at silver like the most stable thing in the world. What about, you know, what about Basecoin or Basis, you know, which is attempting to create a quote unquote, a stable coin that would supposedly lack the pricing volatility of many other digital currencies. I think it was Coinbase that called it yep. the holy grail, which sounds a little hyperbolic. Sure. But w what, where do you fall? What do you think of what, you know, Basis is trying to do? Okay, so, so the, the reason that you, you want to have a stable coin is because people trade crypto, right? You create Bitcoin, Ethereum, everything. 
You can do two things. You can trade Bitcoin to Ethereum. You can trade to 1,600 different tokens or coins. The problem is sometimes you want to be in fiat. Sometimes you want to be flat. Bitcoin price pumps over the course of a day. There's a bunch of short liquidations, as the other traders know here. Sometimes you want to say, all right, I'm going to take my profits. Mm -hmm. There's no way, unless you sell your Bitcoin for dollars and in your bank account, there's no way to keep your dollars in crypto flat at a stable price. So you have Tether, and that's the most traded one right now. Mm -hmm. You have Tether, which is a, a, a coin or a token that's backed by a dollar in a bank accounts, and you can redeem that. And you have True USD and then USDT. So you have three different ones that are trying to, to take, take this, and I, and I would assume other ones. The only issue with, with all of them is that Bitcoin and Ethereum and everything else are valuable because they're based on supply de demand economics. They have the value because everyone believes it has value. These stable coins, you rely on a counterparty. Uh, if, that, if you use a company and that company says, whatever, this token is backed by one ounce of gold, and then that company decided to have an exit scam and run away, then that token won't have any value anymore. Um, and so that's, that's the only risk that you have with these uh, stable coins. Got it. What about um, ICOs? You know, it's, it seemed as though ICOs boomed last year. Yeah. And they also boomed during the first half of this year. That being said, you know, based on data I received, um, it looks as though ICOs sort of really fell off during yep. June and July. Do you think the ICO boom is, is over? Or what are, we, what are we looking at here? I don't think it's over. I think it's going to get smarter. How so? Um, markets are efficient when we allow them to be. But they're not as fast as regulators are. Even regulators that we assume are slow are faster than, than, than let, letting the market actually play itself out. And it's interesting to see how we let the ICO market play itself out. Um, people got screwed, people made money, things kind of tapered off. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see how things kind of go in the next round. You'll see smarter ones. You'll see security tokens. You'll see projects that will actually have to launch and build something before they do a token sale. The token will actually have to have some value and utility before anything happens. So the, the process will happen, and, and we'll see the next time around it gets smarter. Got it. Um, you know, today, for instance, I want, to talk, I want to talk a little bit about regulation just sure. a little bit. Um, you know, today, for instance, you know, the SEC can't reject another round of ETFs. Um, and it, it looks as basically the perception being that this rejection is, might hamper broader acceptance yeah. of investing in, in crypto. We're not ready for an ETF. No? No, the market's too liquid. It's too manipulable. Um, it's very, I mean, I'll just give you an example. There's like one place that has the largest derivatives trading, BitMEX. Um, and they do the most. They do billions of dollars a day and in the crypto space. And there, this is just one. There, there needs to be more than one. Mm -hmm. I'll just give you an example. So they announced that they're, this is two days ago. They announced that they're doing weekly maintenance and on Wednesday. Everyone who had, who had open trades there were frozen. They couldn't log in and close their trades. As soon as they shut, as soon as they shut down and went on maintenance for that hour, the largest exchanges where um, BitMEX derives their, their price index from, someone put a few hundred million dollars in and started pumping the price. And the reason they did that was when the BitMEX would open, all these people would have to sh cover their shorts or else get crazy liquidated and pump the price under $2,000. If you could do that in an asset class, how are we ready for an ETF? Fair enough. Um, and I'm a, I'm a perma bull for life. I want an ETF. I want mm -hmm. it. But I also want it to be where people don't get screwed, and I don't want people to get, you know, to, to we only have a first shot at it. Mm -hmm. If we have an ETF, something happens, we get screwed, they shut it down. You know how hard it's going to be to have an ETF again? An ETF will happen. I would almost pin certainty in 2019. 2019 yeah. for ETF. Yeah, okay. I think almost. I'm putting my money on 2019. Got it. Um, I want to circle back briefly to BitInstant, um, which was, you know, obviously a, bit, a Bitcoin exchange. We're seeing a proliferation of exchanges out there, Coinbase. Robinhood, is, you know, got yep. into it. What are your thoughts on what's going on there? It's great because you're seeing, like, companies launch that are just crypto. And then you have companies like Square and Robinhood that were non-crypto and now say, oh, we want to get into the space and offer our services to the crypto space. Back in the day, back in the day, that's what I tried to do. I would go to these existing companies like Western Union and say, please get into crypto. We need your services. We need you to help us create an on and off ramp for the crypto. And they laughed at us. Um, they did. They laughed at me out of their restaurant. They didn't even pay for the dinner. Um, so you need that. You, you need those companies. And it's awesome to see that, like, finally, 
we're being taken seriously. Gandhi said, first they fight you, then they laugh at you, then they ignore you, then, no, I screwed that up. But then they first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. So now we're like at the, the laughing, fighting stage. Got it. Um, what would you, what sort of parting advice would you give to members of the audience and people watching? For instance, you mentioned that the on-ramp for youth for investing is between 5,000 and 6,000. Yep. Um, for, for people in the audience, like what, what would you recommend to them? Uh, you alluded earlier, for example, yep. that maybe they shouldn't bank on Bitcoin. Yep. Um, we've certainly seen some cautionary tales in the past of people who put too much of their money in and maybe lost Yeah, never, never put your, to your money into like more than, 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 than one like single one. Don't try to like FOMO, fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. That emotion is the worst thing you can do. Um, at Crypto IQ, I actually put up my model portfolio up there. So people ask like, what are you buying? What are you selling? What are you trading? It's up there. You can see in real time like what we're doing. Um, but I always say like pick a basket, pick ones you like, pick something in the top 10 or 20 and, and look at those and, and learn about them and, and take a stake in them. Any crypto you're gonna buy, hold for five years. Say, I'm gonna lock this and this money is locked for five years. And you'll, almost, you'll always, not always, but there's a very high probability that you'll come out ahead in five years because usually these bull and bear markets go you know, two year cycles. Mm -hmm. um, look at now, like people who bought in at the top I know people who bought a Bitcoin at 18,000, and they're wrecked right now because the price is at six. They're down a crazy percentage. I tell them, listen, you can sell. It's not a loss until you sell. So you can sell now, or you can try to hold it and see what happens over the next few years. Um, I was I was giving out free options to people back in the day. I said, I said I'll give you a free option. Bitcoin's at $15,000 right now. You buy one Bitcoin, and if the price is not higher in the next five years, I will buy it back from you at $15,000. People took those options from me. I just gave them out for free. It's nice. like word of mouth. And, uh, and those people are holding. Got it. So uh, moral of the story, lock for five years. Yeah. ETF in 2019. 2019. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, any, any other parting words of advice? Any, how else do you see the markets evolving? Um, token sales are not inherently bad. People always assume they are. Um, I always, when, when people are asking me, like, what do you look for when you invest in a token sale or buy tokens? Mm -hmm. I always look at the team. What, um, where do they come from? What past probability do they have to execute? Have they executed before? What are they doing? Do they have a platform built? Are they just like, are you just buying something that doesn't exist yet and it launches on a white paper? Um, and, that, and, and always ask yourself, why do they need a blockchain? And if you could answer that question, then maybe it's something worth looking into. Great. Well, Charlie Shrem, Crypto IQ, thank you so much for your time and your insight this afternoon. I know we all appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I'm giving a, uh, a there's a cocktail reception at six o'clock right after this. We're talking about a project that we're looking at called Loop, and everyone's invited. Great. Well, we'll see you there. Thank you, JP. Thank you, Charlie Shrem. The exhibit hall is open. TIF Crep. You have a nice drink ticket from them. Please go next door. We will look forward to that. There is also a crypto and conversation reception in partnership with Loop, which Charlie Shem just invited you to, and that reception will take place from 6 to 7.30 in Knob Hill Room, 2 and 3 on the 6th floor. Please enjoy the receptions, and thank you.